Good afternoon. Come on, come on, come on. I was waiting. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome. We're glad to see those of you who've made it here at the time that you've made it here. We welcome you. We anticipate that others are on their way. And uh, once they arrive, I'm sure that they'll be treated to what you're about to be treated to from the beginning. Welcome to the 400 year commemoration of the first documented Africans in English North America. Our current sponsors are the, well first of all, let me back all the way up, because I did something protocol-wise that's, that's almost unforgivable. I didn't tell you who I am. <laughs> My name is Gene Stevenson. I'm known as Bala Jean. I am the president of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society Incorporated. And I am so happy to be here, happy to see such wonderful representation from the community. And that's who I am. Our current sponsors are the Afro-American Historical Genealogical Society known as OGS, A-A-H-G-S, Project 16, which of course has played such a historical role in raising the consciousness of this very effort that we're discussing this afternoon, and the American Revolution, or Evolution, which is Virginia to America, 1619-2019. Does everyone have an agenda? Yes. There's someone who doesn't, raise your hand. Okay. Make sure you get an agenda. For those of you that do have an agenda, if you will pay close attention to it, I'll just review it briefly. We're going to have a afternoon uh, educational forum that will be in two segments. The first, well first we'll have our introduction by, the, uh, by Mr. Rick Murphy, which is the history behind the history. The first panel will deal with the arrival of these Africans in 1619, what was the middle passage by Dr. Evelyn McDowell, the arrival of English in Jamestown in 1607, Tim Stevens, Hampton, connecting the periods of Point Comfort and Fort Monroe by Calvin Pearson. Our second session will be their legacy. The genealogy by Catherine Knight, community engagement, the legacy of the first Africans, Dr. Nicholas Gaffney, and how to teach this history in the public schools by Dr. Samuel Livingston. So here we are at the beginning. So let's begin. I'd like to introduce Mr. Rick Murphy. today. You know, I have chills just standing here because this is where it all happened. This is where it started. This is where our history started. This is where American history started. This is where slave history started. And this is where African American history started. I have chills because Many of you are the direct descendants from the first documented Africans that came to English North America. This is the community that even my own people came from. And this is a community that 
is rich in history, but more important than that, you all live on the very land that it all started. So not only is this historic from a national perspective, not only is it historic from a personal perspective, yet you are the legacy of those proud men and women who came here 400 years ago. So I don't know any other way to say this that this is the beginning. So what we're going to talk about today, or what I'm going to talk about today, is the path of 1619. And I want you first to understand that this is very important history to me because I'm descended from two, if not three, of those original documented Africans. So when I say this is personal, it's not personal just because I'm a historian. It's not personal just because I'm an author. These are my people. These are your people. I first want to say that over the last 15, 20 years, I've been doing an awful lot of research. The last 40 years, I've done an awful lot of research on my people. And the past 10 years, I have done an awful lot of research on particular the area in which these first documented Africans came from. So part of my presentation <clears throat> is to help make a shift in thinking. Now, <clears throat> my presentation is all mapped out, and some of you have heard my presentation before. But I'm going to digress for five minutes on my presentation, because I want you to understand how important this is. I'm from Boston, and I think I kind of have a Boston attitude. <laughs> now, when I was a child, my grandmother and her sisters who came from this area would joke because they all were of different colors. And when they took the train south, they joked about who could remain in the front of the car and who had to sit in the back of the car. And this was a running joke between the sisters because they all tried to dress in such a fashion because they wanted to sit in the front of the car, the front of the train. So I learned as a young person never to take a back seat. Mm -hmm. And yesterday something happened that I'm gonna share with you to help explain how important this history is and why it's important that we understand this history and why it's important that we correct this history. Mm -hmm. How many of you have been to Jamestown settlement? How many of you have been there since they've had this new Angela project? Well, I went there yesterday with Dr. Evelyn McDowell, the <coughs> president of the Sons and Daughters of the Middle Passage, and I said, Evelyn, I really want to make sure you go there to see where it all started. So we got there in time for the 2 o'clock presentation, which had already started. I was determined to stand in the back because I've been driving for the past six hours. And the young gentleman proceeded to explain the history. And as he explained this history, he said they were slaves because they were black. And in Europe, black meant darkness and dirty. So you can imagine what's going through my Boston mind at this point because I knew I was going to say something. He then continued to talk about how they were slaves, the, because in Africa, they were slaves, and that's what they thought they were in Europe, they were slaves. And then he proceeded to tell a story about these five African princesses who noticed that those who were white were pretty. So they wanted to move north so they could be pretty in Africa. So I challenged him on this with all of these people standing there. I had to challenge him on their concept. How do you know they were slaves? Because they were black. I couldn't let that rest. So I continued to challenge him. 
And I said to him, I will discuss this with your boss, Jim Horn. Now, I didn't realize at the time, because everybody was sitting down, and there was a gentleman with a big hat. So when they were, we were all asked to walk over to the archaeological dig, I realized that this particular gentleman was, was an African-American, or American of African descent. So I thought. So when we went over to the archaeological dig, the young gentleman moved himself from the larger group to talk to me. And the gentleman who came over, he was either from Africa or the Caribbean. His skin was very, very dark. And he said, that upset me something terrible. Here I was, the only black person in the group. And he said to me, I'm glad you said something. Because I didn't know how to. Again, I learned from grandmothers who had to sit at the front, of, sorry, sit at the back of the train when it came to Washington, D.C. I wasn't going to let that ride. Now, while he was talking to the larger group, he said that the whites were indentured servants. I said, how do you know that? I said, most of them came over as convicts, thieves, prostitutes, stolen children. He did not correct me. I wish he had. But then when we were just the three of us, he apologized. I said, why didn't you do that in the larger group? He then said, well, we know that 80% of them were poor. Why didn't you say that in the larger group? Why are you now telling me this now? So I said to him, your story will resonate everywhere I go because it's a false narrative. Now, when we were in the larger group, and I asked him, how do you know? He says, well, when I was in school here in Virginia, we were taught they were indentured. I said, well, why didn't you say that now? Why did you change the narrative? Mm -hmm. Now, when I do my presentations, it's important that we understand that I'm going to help you with a paradigm shift. And those of you who work for government and you went to large conferences and they would talk about paradigm shifts, meaning you've got to think about something different than the way you were taught. If you're in business, they want to make money. So however you're doing something, they want a paradigm shift because you've got to do something differently. Now, what's interesting about the first documented Africans in English North America when we started this journey of educating people two years ago, we were hitting a brick wall. But the past two years, things have changed. And why did they change? Because people started taking DNA tests. So this no longer was a black story. This wasn't a story about, getting so excited to do my presentation. This wasn't a story just about African Americans trying to tell their story now, Americans of African descent, DNA began to change the story that became a story of European Americans of African descent. Because when all these folks started doing their DNA, they started to find out that they had black ancestry, African ancestry. So we now are a nation of immigrants. Not just because people tell us that, but because our DNA is letting us know that. So it's becoming a, a, a very different story now. You know, my present, I guess I'm upsetting the stage here. <laughs> but we're a nation of immigrants. And I'm going to have a discussion about a nation of immigrants. So that's how I'm going to start my presentation about a nation of immigrants. Now, there was a meeting in the White House where someone made the statement, why do we want people from Africa and Haiti? Because they come from S-hole countries. Mm -hmm. Then what was said on January 11th, widely reported in the press, why don't we have more people from Norway come here? There was a meaning to that. Because those who came from S-hole countries brought no value, and those who come from Norway do. Time for a paradigm shift. 
In 2015, there was a major study that was taken. Migration Policy Institute out of Washington, D.C. Don't believe me, look it up. 39% of those from the Sub-Sahara have 39% have, 30, uh, 39 have bachelor's degrees. Compared to 29% of those who come from other nations here. And only 31% of U.S. born. 75% are in the civilian labor force, compared to 66% of the other foreigners who come here, and 62% of native-born. Most of them are employed in management, business, and science, more than those who are born here. A paradigm shift. Now, history repeats itself. And I'm going to explain how history repeats itself. And that's where we start with the 20 and odd Africans. The first recorded Africans in English North America. Now, before someone says they weren't the first Africans here, no, they were not. We know Africans came here with Christopher Columbus. We know Africans were here as part of Spanish America. But that our history, our U.S. history, English history starts our history, and these Africans were so well documented, which made them unique. So not only did we start with these 20 United Africans, they were unique in every single way possible. And my presentation will talk about their uniqueness. Now, the presentations about globalization, colonization, integration, and propagation. That's what this story is all about. And I hope those of you from Hampton will remember that because these are your people. So let's talk about globalization. Now, when you go to Webster, well, Webster talks about globalization. I can't do a better job than Webster, but if you need the definition, there it is. But there was a time in world history where Western Europe was connected with Eastern Europe and with Asia. And that was stopped. And that's why those from Western Europe tried to find every way they could to get to the Far East. We know the story of 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. You know the story behind that. They got that story correct. But our story starts on the Iberian Peninsula. And the Iberian Peninsula was a peninsula that was shared by Spain and Portugal. They were family members. If their family was like my family, we didn't get along. And as they tried to find ways to get to the Far East, they started to go to these non-Christian lands. And what happened was, they kept discovering the same place. And I was here first. No, I was here first. You know how it goes within families. And they almost came to a bitter, bitter war. And they knew if they came to a bitter war, nobody would win. So they need an arbitrator, somebody to break the larger jam for them. And since the two kings were Catholic, they decided to go to the Pope. And they said to the Pope, we keep discovering the same lands. Oh, what should we do? And the Pope said, we're going to sign a treaty. And Portugal, you're going to have everything to the right of the line. And Spain, you're going to have everything west to the line. So the Atlantic Ocean was essentially divided in half. The world was divided in half. Portugal got the east. Spain got the West. Now someone else will raise their hand, so before you do that, how did Brazil become Portuguese? You ask? It depends on how the line was drawn. And that's the map of 1492, where the Pope told Spain, you own everything in the Spanish hemisphere, the hemisphere to the West, and Portugal, you own everything and the people in the East. 
So you ask, what made Spain and Portugal think they were the kings of the world and they owned everything? The Pope told them so in the 1492 treaty. Now, in that 1492 treaty, once it was decided that Africa belonged to Portugal, Portugal started to go up the tributaries of Africa and they decided that we own this land and we now want to start to meet the people. And the first group of people they met in the 15th and 16th centuries was the Bantu empires. Now these empires were interested. Now Angola was part of Congo. So if I start the conversation about Congo, then you see me evolve into Angola, there's a reason for that. But these were highly civilized civilizations. They embraced Christianity in very short order. They embraced intercontinental trade. They actually sent students from Congo and Angola to Europe to study. They brought back technological advancements. And they traded in slaves. Now, how do we know this? Because Diogo, who was their explorer, wrote tremendous letters going back and forth, and these letters are documented in the Spanish Empire. He could not get over how civilized these people were. He actually said they live in kingdoms no different than our own. They live in cities just like our own. They have priests, they have governors, they have judges, just like our own. Who knew? Who would have thought? But more important, who would have thought this would have been written down? And this starts the discussion of the Middle Passage. Now the Middle Passage, I think I have a whole lecture on the Middle Passage. I'm going to truncate in five seconds. It was a transatlantic slave trade. It was the largest movement of people in world history. Approximately 1544 to 1860, 315 years, 12 million Africans were forcibly taken from their home and sent someplace else. Only 10 million reached their port of call. 15% were lost to history. And even though today there are 44 million Americans of African descent and another 20 million Americans of European descent with African ancestry, only 350,000 came here. That's all. Which means if only 350,000 came here, these are the people we came from. Colonization. Same thing, I don't need to read the definition. But they went there to colonize the Congo. And this is what the explorer, Diallo Cabo, wrote back to Spain. Congo was considered one of the greatest kingdoms of Central Africa covered more than 115,000 square miles with 4 million people. Kingdom was founded much like the royal kingdoms of Europe. The Bantu people. Now, talk to DNA. Many of you find this, these Bantu people now in your DNA stuff that you're getting at. They live in some of the most influential and powerful African kingdoms in West Africa. The people were an advanced, permanently settled farming and herding people who forged iron tools and weapons and who lived in the same towns year after year. Now, I don't know about you. My first introduction to Africans was what? Tarzan. Tarzan. And as a child, all I heard was four syllables. Um, um, and um. That was the language they had, because that's what we saw on television. They lived in thatched homes. They all wore grass skirts. They all had bones in their noses, spears in their hands, and a pot, a pot ready to cook somebody in. 
But that's not what they found in 16, uh, uh, when, they, when they went there in the late 1400s. They found a people where their language was highly developed. They lived in highly structured urban communities. They were still with metals and iron and copper. They were still potters. They wove mats and articles of clothing. They domesticated animals. Remember that. They domesticated animals, including pigs, sheep, chickens, and cattle. And they were still then using farming tools. That's what they found in the 1400s. I saw Tarzan in the 1950s. The king had a central administrative body. He had a capital city with a palace. There were lords who acted like high priests. There were provincial governors. The king made his favorite son gov son's governors. They had a strong base to contest secession. The governors nominated lesser lords. This is a highly developed community. These were the Bantu people. On May 3rd, 1491, how do we know this? This stuff is all in the archives in Spain and Portugal and in Rome. The king of Congo was so impressed with these Europeans, he and six of his chiefs, chiefs took Portuguese names and they converted to Catholicism. They were Catholic. The king's immersion into Christianity so impressed the Pope that he called him our most beloved son. And in 1518, he named his son the first black bishop of Africa. How do we know this? It's in the documentation of Rome. In fact, they had a Catholic bishop before Western Europe did because they were going through the Protestant Reformation. Let's talk about Jamestown now. And after my incident yesterday, I'm on a roll in Jamestown. <laughs> it was founded in 1607. The land was nothing more than a swamp. The colony was owned by the London Company. You know, we misunderstand, we think that England discovered Jamestown. It was actually the London Company. And those of you who are from Detroit or any company town, you know the company, much like Spain and Portugal, believes that they own everything. And all of the inhabitants in 1607 and shortly thereafter were employees of the London Company. Now those of you who start your own businesses or work for a small business, you know it's real hard when you start with the business and most fail. In the first years of Jamestown, it was an absolute failure. I'm sure if some of you have heard about uh, the, the um, 1610, 1611, the, star, the starving period. I'm sure those of you have heard that those arrowheads, as small as they were, they always seemed to hit their target. I'm sure all of you have heard about the swamp and mosquitoes and everything else. And if they didn't die by an arrow, arrowhead, if they didn't die from starvation, they died from disease. Almost every ship that came here, a third were, were, were dead in short order. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard this expression before. <laughs> Drain the swamp. <laughs> Jamestown was so bad, they couldn't recruit settlers to come here. This wasn't paradise. This is in Paradise Island down in the, in the Bahamas in, in 2020. There was a high attrition rate, atrocities by the local natives, famine, disease, poor management. The majority of the men came from the peasant class. 
They were poor. They were uneducated. They were orphaned or homeless. And many had commuted prison sentences. And I want you to hold that thought because I'm going to prove it to you shortly. But they worked for the London Company's indentured servants. Some of them, not all of them. When the ship left London and they couldn't fill their quota, they kidnapped people to bring them here because nobody wanted to come. Now, we know that the documented Africans came in 1619, so I wanted to show you something that happened after they came here. On November 20th, 1622, there was a list of 60 men and women, and poor Alice was convicted for killing an infant. We don't know if it was hers or not, but because of the infection with which the prisons are infected, they were put to work and transported by the Privy Council to Jamestown. In 1623, after the massacre of 1622, where a third of the population was killed by the Native Americans, Captain Bailey went to the king and said, let's take 3,000 poor people, give them 20 acres of land, a house, empty out the prisons. That's who was here. Now, I learned in history class that, again, coming from Boston, we had the Mayflower. And everybody wants to belong to the Mayflower Society or the Jamestown Society because they were well-to-do people who came here. So I couldn't understand if one was true, how could the other be true? But there's a book out there called The Complete Book of Immigrants. And I think some of my slides are missing, so I'm hoping that they come up later on. So Peter Wilson came up with a book of all the immigrants who came here, so I trust that it's going to be later on, so somehow my slides get mixed up, but I will not forget this point. Now I'm going to talk about the Africans. We should no longer call them the Africans because we know where they came from. So when I hear people say the first Africans, or the Africans, that, is, that upsets me. Because we know they came from Angola. We know the city they came from. We know the dates that they came from. The ships that they came from. In January 5th and February, the Royal African Village of Kabasa was taken over by the Portuguese. Now you need to understand, over 200 years, these folks were Catholic. They now all had Spanish names. But there was one problem with these very educated Africans. Many of them were going back and forth between Spain, Rome, Portugal, even England, to learn, to study, and bring back their knowledge. They were living on top of a silver mine. And you know what that meant. They had to go. That's what the Europeans were looking for. Gold and silver. And their city was on top of a silver mine. And the first ones that left were the wealthiest, the educated, the powerful. To control the city, those were the ones you had to take. 4,000 Angolans were captured. They were placed on 36, and I, I, I need to fix this slide. It was 36 waiting Portuguese ships. So the ships that were out in the harbor were the ones that brought the, the soldiers. 350 of them left on one ship called the San Juan Baptista. Now, someone after me is going to give you much more information about the San Juan. No, you're not doing it today, are you, Catherine? No. Okay. Uh, the San Juan Bautista was actually a Japanese ship bought by the Spanish during the Spanish Armada and renamed. And Catherine Knight has a book that describes that much better than I. 
Oz Journal is going to have a special edition article. And on that ship were the 20 and odd. They were men, they were women, they were children. And they would become the first recorded Africans in English North American history. Now, I want to digress a bit because this is confusing and I need to make sure you understand the story. Because these are your ancestors, my ancestors. We got to get this right. When they left Angola, they were enslaved. When they were to arrive in New Spain, which is present-day Mexico, they were to be enslaved. There is no question about that. But they were kidnapped on the high water by two English ships, the White Lion and the Treasurer. If I go into your garage and I steal your brand new Mercedes, and I want to take it up to New Jersey, no offense, Evelyn. <laughs> and I want to sell your brand new Mercedes. Do I have the right to do that? No, because I don't have title to the vehicle. And when those Angolans were stolen from the San Juan Bautista, 350 miles off the coast of New Spain, the captain of that ship, his name was Captain Acuna. Remember that name, Captain Acuna. And when they stole the Africans, the Angolans from the San Juan Baptista, they brought them to Virginia. And they sold them for food. Now because they did that, the history is that made them slaves. But the ambassador to Spain went to the king of England and said, that's not your property. Just like I went to the police that's not your car. Now, were the laws that developed in 1619? You betcha. Because the English-Spanish War was over and there was a treaty called the London Treaty. And the London Treaty clearly spelled out no piracy. And the king took this very seriously because he could not afford another war. England was almost broke. Now, if anybody wants proof that the king was serious, how many of you are from North Carolina? What's your capital? Raleigh. What happened to Sir Raleigh? He was beheaded in 1618 because of piracy. That was the legacy of Sir Walter Raleigh because the king was serious, no piracy. So when these Africans came here, while they may have left Africa as slaves, they might have gone to New Spain, Mexico to be slaves, and when they came here, perhaps they wanted them to be slaves, but their chain of custody broke, and the king honored that. There's more to the story. Now an indenture is when you bind somebody as an apprentice or a laborer. A slave is a, is a person who is a legal property of another person and is forced to obey them. So let's make sure we understand these definitions. Because slave is now being thrown around loosely, just like the young man did yesterday, just because you're black, you're a slave. Now the indentured servants came here to work under a contract. Many of them, not all. At which time, after a certain period of time, their indenture be paid off and they were allowed to go free. So the difference between indenture and a slave is that at some point in time, the indenture goes free and a slave does not. It's perpetual. So if they were a slave, you should never find any of these people in the colonial records. In the first census taken in 1620, we know that there were 32 Africans who were here, and they were called non-Christian. That's interesting. 
They were Catholic. <laughs> the English called them non-Christian. The Pope went around and said that the English were the ones who were non-Christian because they were protesting. But the first recorded Africans in 1620, the list of 1623, which was the list taken after the massacre, the king wanted to know who was here, we find they had names like Margarita and Juan and Pedro. They were Christian names. They were Catholic names. They spoke multiple languages. Who knew? Including English. Who knew? They were literate. They could read. They could write. They could compute. Far different cry from those who were poor from England, the peasants. The London Company had its own rules and regulations, but it followed British common law. And a year before the Africans, the Angolans came here, they set up a headright system. They had to provide so many incentives to bring this here. So they said to the captains, for every 50, now the people who headed up the colony were all captains, they were sea captains. And they said to these sea captains, for every person you bring here, every head you bring there, you have a right of 50 acres of land. Head right, became one word, head right. It was a legal grant to settlers. You bring 50 people here, you get 250 acres of land. The first recorded Africans were unique in every way possible. So when you tell the story about your ancestors, you need to be clear that this is a unique story. This is not a story of every African who came here. But they came at a very unique time when nobody was born here other than the Native Americans, not even the English. They came at a time of British common law. They came at a time of the headright system. And remember that word, headright system. I hate to do this to you. <laughs> How do we know all of this? In 2019, is this new information? No. In fact, it's found in court transcripts here in all the colonies, the original colonies. It's found in the judicial rulings here in the original colonies. There are transcribed personal statements here in the original colonies. There are state papers here in the original colonies. And those of you who don't want to go to the library and go through all that stuff, out there that has taken these abstracts and put them in the books. You can see the names right here. And I start chewing them for you. Peter Wilson Coleman's book and John Hamden Houghton's book. Now, we all are up there in age, so I'm not expecting you to be able to read those words carefully. So I thought what I would do is I would provide you the cover of that book. Now, you know what I learned in history? That when they came here, they came, and there's a list, a original list of persons of quality. So we were told that the people who came here in the early, 18, early 1600s were people of quality. But we know better. Because we know to look at the subtitle. I didn't make the name of this book up. Immigrants, exiles, rebels, <laughs> men sold, sold for a term of years. Now who would have been sold for a term of years if they're coming from England? Apprentices, children stolen, maidens pressed, and others who, who went from Great Britain to the American plantations. That's what's in the books. They have every single name of every person who came here. Who knew? In Coleman's book, Immigration to the Americas, 
the felons, destitute children, political religious, non-conformists, vagabonds, beggars, and other undesirables. That's who came here. Who knew? Now, is this what you learned in school? I certainly didn't. Please go to your library and get those books. I want, I want to make sure that you don't think this was fake news. Now, where can you find this wonderful material? Well, I thought I'd look up to find the closest library who yeah. has this stuff. So just go to 313 First Street, Williamsburg, Virginia, 23185, open from 9 to 5 p.m., Monday through Friday, and you can look at these books and you can find their names. Some of your ancestors may be on these lists. Now we're going to talk about integration. And we know what Webster says integration is, because time is running short. But the first 20 non Africans, for almost 40, 50 years, there's only a handful of them here. And these are the counties of your people. I don't need to tell you where your people are from. You see your names here. Propagation. You know what propagation is. I don't need to get down in the weeds about this. But you know what's interesting about propagation? These first Africans, they suffered religious persecution, economic persecution when they came here, racial persecution, and everything you could imagine happened to them. And guess what? We find their names in those books that I showed you owning land. Anthony Johnson is feeling on 2,000 acres of land. And you know how he did that? He didn't buy the land. Nobody would sell it to him. Do you know how he got 2,000 acres of land? What were those two words? Head rights. He grew tobacco, sold it in England, and paid for English people to come here to work for him. He owned English servants. Quite a few of these Africans own English servants. Many of your ancestors own English servants. We find them owning land. Where they get the money? Because they knew how to farm animals. The peasants from London and all those urban areas didn't know anything about animal husbandry. They didn't know about farming, agriculture. They barely knew how to use a saw to cut down a tree. These Africans brought such unique skills to the colony that they helped save the colony. Who knew? And where did we find this? In the library in Williamsburg. Who knew? Now those poor English maidens who were pressed a lot of those English men didn't want them. So they were gold diggers. They went after some of these men who had land. And that's how we begin to find many of our English names. So in the 1620s, you start to find names of offspring from these interracial, interracial relationships. I'm sure your names are up there. I'm sure your grandparents' names are up there. I'm sure your great grandparents' names are up there. These are your, because these are your people. Hampton? Those are original Angolans, and I know everybody's trying to take down pictures and stuff. I'm going to do something better for you momentarily. So save, your, save your battery, save your film. These 20 and odd Africans, Angolans, they became the head of 500 of the early African families. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. They became the head of the first 500 free African families. Now, this is a gentleman by the name of Paul Hine. Did a wonderful service for all of us. And he cataloged all of those names. And he put them in a two-volume book. Now, I'm an author. And no author should ever badmouth or say anything bad about another author, but don't buy his books. Paul was such a wonderful person. He 
put them online. So this is the picture you want to take because if you go to that website, you can find the names. That's how good a person he was. And this October, at Oz National Conference in Washington, D.C., he's going to be given the highest award the organization can offer for what he did in collecting the information on those names. And not only did he con to, to, to connect the names, he provided the actual documentation where you can research the documentation to support that information. Now, I know a number of you have done your DNA, and a number of you are trying to figure out how to write this stuff down. And you know, as an author, I like to promote other books. And there's a new book out here that actually helps you log all that information, color coordinated in the whole bit. These are the kinds of tools you should be looking for, because if we go back far enough, we're related to one another. And all those old names on that sheet of 500 names, those actual, I'm related to about 200 of them. Who knew? So cuz, 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 cuz. <laughs> it's important that we understand this. It's important that we, we, we know what this history is about. It's important that we teach this history. And it's important that we correct this history. I was at Roots Tech doing this presentation. A very tall, distinguished white gentleman sat in the first row right in front of me. I'm barely five feet, he was well over six feet. And he said to me, you are my cousin. And I said, how? It's not the first time. He said, I'm a goer. I said, me too. And the man broke down and cried. And his family had done their DNA, then they did their research, they documented it, and there were half a dozen people in the room who were going, and he just could not get over that. But what's more important, he's an elder in the Mormon church. So you know he did this right. And he made sure that their tablets went into the mountainside that they collect information on. But the story doesn't stop there. There must have been 30 different Americans of European ancestry who came to me and to Gene and to others who were there and said, I'm documented from the original Angolans. Who knew? This is no longer our story. This is American history. This is a paradigm shift. We gotta change and look at this differently than what we did before. When they say that only whites could be slaves, there's an actual book out there to talk about all the children that were captured between 1660 and 1720. More than 5,000 white children ended into white slavery. When we hear white slavery, we think of women who were captured and sold into prostitution. That name came from someplace else. Mm -hmm. And when you do your DNA, now, I have like 1,200, 1,300 cousins on Ancestry.com, don't mean anything to me. But you can see how, if I were to go back to 1620, I would have 32,000 ancestors. So I know my parents are true. My grandparents makes it four, great grandparents eight. Each generation is just double, double, double. Now we know that didn't happen because there weren't 32,000 Africans here. They had to be Native American blood and, and European blood. So it really looked more like a diamond. Because the further down you go, the closer we become in terms of relationship for Americans whose ancestry come from this country here. My grandmother would say, don't throw a stone at that kid, because somebody he's your cousin. <laughs> don't speak ill of them, because they're your cousin. Now what happened is, slowly but 
and surely, every single accomplishment your ancestors made, when they made that accomplishment, they allowed them to make that accomplishment, and the le next legislative session, <laughs> they turned it into a law so no other African can take advantage of that. <laughs> so when Anthony Johnson and those other Angolans brought white indentures over, a law was made that no African can do, do have head rights anymore, and they can't own Englishmen. In 1662, they passed a law that any African woman who had a child automatically took her steps. We all know that. Baker's Rebellion made it worse. All of these poor peasants rose up. They went to Jamestown. They burned it, along with their African colleagues. And they changed the laws after that. That was the turning point of race relations in the colony. The caste system from England now was established here, and it was based on not just economics, but based on race. Virginia banned all kinds of laws, including interracial marriages. They did that for a reason. They prohibited whites from freeing blacks. And that became the slave codes of 1705, and that was the birth of antebellum slavery. Mm -hmm. So I hope in some small way, I hope you to understand why they were not enslaved when they came here, because they broke international law. King did not want a war. They were unique. They brought tremendous skills that the peasant class did not have. We find their names in the records, in the record books. And we're honored that Catherine Knight is going to introduce you to some of these people by their names. History can keep them as slaves so long as we don't know who they are or where they live. They can keep them enslaved so long as nobody can say those were my ancestors. Mm -hmm. And they're now having difficulty when you now have doctors and lawyers and Indian chiefs and one of the heads of the Mormon church says they were my ancestors. <laughs> and how do they know? From the land records of which they own their land and they pass it off to their descendants. Makes it a very difficult narrative now. Now this is not a story about not claiming your African enslaved ancestors, because I quite frankly think I'm more proud of them than anyone else because the very basic economic foundation of this country was built on their backs. All these organizations and people who are going out and claiming their ancestry we're finding our ancestors. We're honoring our ancestors. We're recognizing our ancestors. We're most fortunate we have Dr. Evelyn McDowell, who is the president of the Sons and Daughters of the United States Middle Passage. They are the only black lineage society. And when they in, in have their induction, you talk about your enslaved ancestor. Mm -hmm. Let's bring them back to life. They built this country. Our history was stolen from us. It was stolen from them. Thank you. Thank you. We will take a 15 minute break and then the next group of experts will come up and share with you their perspective on something else. So, any other question? Yes ma'am. It's good. Oh, no, I didn't. She asked me the name of the book. My book is going to be called 1619, The Story of the First Documented Africans. It won't come out until 1620, because I'm constantly finding new stuff. But what did I say? I'm reading a book out of the University of Miami since 1620. It's going to come out in 2020. <laughs> Yeah. 
This book is written by Stacy R. Webb. It's called The Journey, the subtitle 2019 Genetic Genealogy Handbook and Membership Guide. <laughs> so I'll hold it up if someone wants to take a picture of it. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a question about how much of this is in the African American History Museum in Washington. Excellent question, cousin. A lot, of, a lot of this is actually in the museum. Uh -huh. Oh, in Hampton. Well, I'm, I'm talking about the museum in, uh, um, um, in Washington. I don't, I've not been in the Hampton Museum. If it's not there, and let me tell you something. And this came out of what happened yesterday. Mm. I'm on a roll. Mm -hmm. So when I'm asked questions, I'm going to respond to them slightly different. When you go back to Hampton, and if it's not there, you need to tell them they need to hire odds to come in and put a curriculum and a program in that museum. We're not doing this free anymore. That's right. And you all need to go in that museum and say, why isn't this here? Why are we hearing this 400 years later when these books, you know, when I first started this, everybody says, well, there's no proof. There's no proof. Everybody keeps asking for the proof. And now all those people, I'm trying to proof around, I say, where's your proof? And they tell me about books they read that third, fourth hand books. So if it's not in the Hampton Museum, which it should be, they need to hire somebody to put it in there and put it in there correctly. Any other questions? <laughs> Give it to them. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What happened You know my sister. When the program starts at one, but for you, since you're a cousin, I'm going to tell you. But I'm going to give you the 30 second version. I went to Jamestown, and they started a conversation that they had to be slaves because their skin color was black and dirty. Mm -hmm. what, what was that question? Jamestown. Jamestown Society. I don't want to give up the young man's name yet because I'm holding that as a chip for when I go talk to him about I want them to come up with some money for a program. Mm -hmm. But he's going to go back and tell his boss because I asked him for his business card. And that white was to perceived to be purity. 2019, we're hearing this stuff. Yeah. I would have thought that stuff would have been put in the grave long before now. So again, thank you all. I'll be around, but you're going to hear people much smarter than me on these topics because we have experts that are going to go into each of these areas, and we're also going to talk about how this should be taught in, taught in our schools. And don't, as a former educator, don't get me on that conversation about what these teachers are having our kids line up and having black kids on one side of the room, white kids on the other side of the room, and telling the black kids to run, and the white kids to run after them like they were the slaveholders. 2019. Thank you. Chickens come home to roost. Thank you. <laughs> oh boy. Huh? No, no, no. I've been. It's just my time. You surely did. Good for you. Wonderful.
Ready? Hampton. Now, can we talk? Sometimes when you have somebody who's so close that you don't realize the value of that asset. And sometimes when something is so far away, you realize the value of that asset. I want to introduce our next panel, but I'm going to do them in reverse order. Because it would be disrespectful for me to come to Hampton and not talk about Calvin Pearson. Right. I wrote a book four or five years ago, and this is not a part of the book, but, but uh, you'll understand in a minute. And it's called Freedom Road, an American Family Journal from Jamestown to World War. And I got a call from a very stately gentleman who laid me out. Because I said the first Africans came from Jamestown. And I said, Calvin, that wasn't my intent. Because in the book I talk about how they arrived at Point Comfort. But I needed to sell a book. So Calvin wasn't satisfied with that. But I respected him so much because I learned the journey of Calvin Pearson and the journey of our understanding of the first documented Africans. I've attended meetings with Calvin. I've appreciated his knowledge and his wisdom. I saw how he was disrespected. And although I could not allow that to happen then, I cannot allow this to happen now if I didn't take this special moment to introduce Calvin Pearson. So please, over the next three or four months, as Hampton comes alive with life and activity and energy over this commemoration, remember the man who really was the mission behind much of this. We also have with us Tim Stevens, who I think you're going to appreciate because it's one thing for me to talk about who those English were who came in 1607, but if you hear it from an Englishman, I think you'll have a better appreciation. And it's one thing for me to talk about the Middle Passage, but Dr. McDowell, who is the president of the Sons and Daughters of the Middle Passage, she wants you to hear their voices. So with that, Dr. Emma McDowell. Wow, I have to follow Rick. Rick is an amazing speaker. Um, I am very happy to be here, and I thank you so much to Augs for putting this on. Thank you so much to uh, our sponsors for this uh, session. And um, as Rick mentioned, I want to talk to you about um, the arrival, um, a little bit, uh, as much of information I can give you about it, because um, I want to talk to you about the voices. Um, so I, I wanted to, I did some research um, about the Middle Passage, and I was going to present some, some dry statistics, but I think the best way to talk about the Middle Passage is to hear it from the voices themselves, the people who actually experienced it. So um, I put together a little presentation that um, extracts some of the voices from slave narratives and that, that uh, tell us exactly what they went through. So um, first of all, I want to tell you a little bit about um, what is the Middle Passage. So I'm going to define it. And then we're going to get into the voices. And then at the end, I'm going to tell you a little bit about sons and daughters. So the Middle Passage is the space. It's the, it's, 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 it's the, it's the, it's the um, 
the travel of, of the boats and the, um, uh, uh, the e economic system at the time, where they would go and start up in Europe, and they would go over to, uh, with, uh, they would go to start in Europe with their um, uh, goods and services that they would take to Africa. And, and then once they take, took those uh, services, and serv well not services, but goods to Africa, they would e exchange those um, goods for uh, af um, African bodies or, or, or bodies of the humans and take that cargo to um, the Caribbean and the New World area and, and um, uh, drop them off there and, and create more finished goods and, and the cycle continued. So that's pretty much what the Middle Passage was. And I want to go in and now we're going to start talking about uh, some of the voices. So one of the things that, um, that Rick mentioned uh, that you know, I, I had the same experiences. I had, I was told that uh, in Africa when I was growing up, uh, you know, it was a bad place and people uh, needed to be rescued from it. And uh, we, I was even as a small child when I was uh, going through and learning about this history, I was told, um, you know, and I shiver to think about this, that uh, we were supposed to be happy or fortunate that we were no longer in Africa. But one of the things that I found as I was doing this research, and a, a little bit earlier as well, is that these people had a wonderful life. Um, and they, um, uh, it, they, they were just living life and, and just flourishing uh, before this great, great tragedy came upon them. And um, so I, one of the narratives that I looked at was uh, Zangara's narrative. And he talked about it, the place where his father's house was and, and how that, that particular place had, um, uh, it, you know, it was, it, it was, he didn't have, a, he didn't have, a, he didn't remember the title because he was a young child when he was taken away. But, um, but it was, it was a large place. It had, um, it was, it was cultivated, and you know, it was a great place where he, he, um, his family lived. And then, um, uh, Olada, uh, Olada, uh, Olada, uh, Iquano, and he talked about. Uh, this is a very, very famous narrative, and he talked about how the kingdom was divided into these provinces and districts, and um, it was a remote, um, you know, most of it was, a, it was remote and, and fertile, it was a great place, and, and so, you know, these people talked about these wonderful, wonderful places where they lived. There are many more uh, narratives, but I've only um, got a few of them here. Uh, so uh, uh, Zangara also talked about his mother and, and you know how he had a great time. Um, his uh, he was his mother doted on him, and um, uh, and, and he, he even mentioned that there could not exist on earth a happier society than others um, than than any other. And they all lived harmoniously together, having no disputes that he ever heard of. Now these are exact quotes, and um, so I'm just bringing them out and kind of summarizing a few. Um, then uh, you know, so they, they had these wonderful places, uh, and then John uh, Wesley uh, talked about, and, and some of his he was an abolitionist, and he talked about um, some of the things that uh, he had found out about what was happening in the Middle Passage, and he said that the inhabitants of the Gold Coast. Likewise, when they were, uh, when they are not uh, artfully incensed against each other, and I'll talk more about that later, uh, they lived in great union, fr friendship, being generally well tempered, civil, and you know ready to help each other. And so these societies were very well uh, constructed. But then we have a situation where uh, you know where they were living there and. Uh, and then out of a sudden, um, you know, some of the slides here, uh, and I, I'm going to add because some of the things are, are not, uh, are missing a little bit. But, um, you know, he, he, they, they, they talked about uh, this incentive, unfortunately, when uh, there was this great demand for human bodies. And as a result, it created this toxic environment where people were uh, put into situations where either if they did not, uh, comply, they were being captured. And so uh, there were situations where 
uh, the, the commander of vehicle of, of, of vessels, and they talk about this one, where um, a vessel would come and, and uh, they would say, uh, hey, we need uh, these uh, X amount of bodies. So unfortunately, what would happen is that, that, that the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, what, what do I want to say? Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, oh boy, I'm sorry. Uh, what would happen was that these, uh, uh, the cat, the, not the, boy, tribes, I'm sorry, the, the chiefs of the tribes um, uh, would, uh, you know, would go and, and, and make war, uh, according to these uh, uh, narratives, would make war to, uh, uh, to accommodate the list of demands for these bodies. And so the, um, uh, the warring would happen, unfortunately. And so these lives were upended, and, and um, Zangara talks about how his life was upended. So he was sleeping at night, and then all of a sudden he heard all of these, uh, uh, the noise, and he, he knew it had to be noise that he thought came from guns. And he talked about how his whole life was disrupted. Um, his, his, he was there with his wife and three children. He talked about how his uh, infant daughter was taken and, dr and drowned in the stream. Uh, he heard yelling and screaming. Uh, his father was killed. He thought his father was killed. And his mother was burned in the flames. Um, then, uh, we, after they were taken, uh, many, pe many people went through another passage where they were taken from where they were living and then they were taken to, to the uh, coast uh, where they were put in bear coons and, and other holding places. And so he talked about how they uh, took his family and walked across for uh, seven days uh, to this new place where they were held. And many people died along the way. They also talked about, in the narratives, uh, about how when the people actually got there, and uh, they were stripped naked and uh, branded. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, it, you know, the humiliation uh, that these men and women endured uh, only got worse when they arrived. Then, we, then they also uh, talked about boarding the ship. And many of them talked about how at the ship, uh, they saw this big ship and they were very afraid um, uh, Aquino talked about when he was on the ship, he saw these um, the furnaces and uh, copper boiling, uh, and he just knew, he saw the faces of the people, and he just knew that his, his fate was, was uh, dire, and that these horrible things are, it's just going to get worse. He said he fainted at the sight. Then they, uh, were, once they were boarded on the ship, they were put into these um, in the bowels of the ship. And uh, Aquino talked about how as soon as he got there, he, the stench um, in his, uh, his nostrils, uh, it was unbearable. He wanted to die at that point just by the smell of, of the, uh, uh, the place where he was. And then there's the voyage. And uh, Aquino also talked about how um, one day uh, there was this nice smooth sailing, but then all of a sudden there was turmoil, uh, and many people were, were brought about um, out of the ship, and people jumped out. Um, he said that, uh, and I believe many more of them would have done the same if they had a chance. So people basically killed themselves because uh, they uh, could not endure it any longer. Uh, and um, Zangara talked about how horrified he was to see how other people were being treated. Mm -hmm. And so he talked about how the, the ship had tossed and turned and there was a violent part of the, uh, the voyage. And he was holding hands with his, his, the person next to him. And then all of a sudden, um, the next morning, they realized that the hand was cold and that person had died. And they had heard screams of people and women and children be screaming, and then the, the men, the white men who were on the ship were uh, yelling out and, and, and um, happily, I guess, um, as, as to what they were doing to these uh, poor people on the, on the ship. 
But then their worst fears were people who uh, were able to have uh, come together and have a revolt. And um, so um, I got the uh, narrative, well, not a narrative, it wasn't a narrative, unfortunately, but the uh, talking about uh, the, um, uh, there was a, a, a judging and uh, a trial for the Amistad. And um, so I took out one of the uh, descriptions by uh, Pedro Mon Montes, who was a crew member, and he talked about how uh, there was this big um, uprising and uh, they beat him on the head, the, the, co the cook that was there was killed, and he went on deck and, um, and he was being attacked and with the knives and, um, and other people were, were killed, and then, so they talked, he talked about how he almost was um, uh, killed as well. And so this, uh, this was their worst nightmare, and it happened quite often um, uh, and to, in my research. I, I saw several events where it happened. So these are some of the things. So I do want to end this talk, of, uh, give you some statistics. Uh, Rick Murphy did give you a few of them, but there were 30,000 voyages. I mean, if you think about what I just told you about what happened on these voyages, 30,000 of them um, went on. And uh, 12 million people were taken from their homelands, from their uh, idyllic um, homes that they had, and, and their wonderful lives were upended and taken. Uh, of the horror um, of, of this event. Um, and it went over for many, many years. Uh, two million people died on those voyages. And so we're only talking about the voyage, the millions of people who died on, that, on the ocean. But think about all the people who died on their way to those places um, before they were taken. And then, um, and then there were uh, 300,000 to 385,000 people that actually arrived in the United States and um, what, what, what is the, the colonial America. And that the enslaved people um, were, they existed everywhere in the 13 colonies. Not many people realize that I'm, I live um, in Cleveland, well, I grew up in Cleveland, but I now live in New Jersey. And New Jersey has a very, very uh, deep history of slavery. And so many people have no clue uh, they think it only happened down here in the South, but it was all throughout the 13 colonies. And lastly, I just want to tell you quickly about the organization. It is a hereditary society, very similar to the Daughters of American Revolution. You have to connect to that enslaved ancestor and then document your um, uh, lineage to that person. Um, then you, you would take that uh, information and you would submit it to us and we have two registrars. We have a, um, the only uh, African American, I think she's still the only African American, um, certified genealogist. She's, she's one of our genealogists or our registrars. Um, and our mission is to connect to those enslaved people and encourage people to do that. And then once you do that, we also uh, commemorate them. And that's what we do. So we commemorate and then we help educate the public about these these individuals and the wonderful things that they have done. Um, and we can never, ever forget them. We have our third annual conference is coming up uh, this weekend, coming up on the 7th and 8th, and where we'll, we will be rewarding um, uh, people in the communities doing this work, and we're also rewarding uh, the um, uh, people who've written great books on this subject. Um, Catherine uh, Knight is one of the people who will be uh, getting an award as well as uh, Tim Stevens and uh, Rick Murphy uh, will be getting an award. So, and then we also give awards to people in the community as well. I think I mentioned that, but uh, please go to our website if you want to any, uh, any information about our organization and what's happening on June 7th and 8th. Thank you. Good afternoon, thank you very much, Evelyn. That was a great presentation. Um, looking forward to the discussion with you and others afterwards. Thank you to everyone here. Uh, thank you for the invitation to Hampton. Jean, thank you very much. And all of the other organizers, Calvin, it's uh, certainly an honor to be talking right in front of you. I hope I can fulfill that. So, what I would like to talk about, uh, 
I will if I move forward, is the special relationship. Um, no Winston Churchill quotes. None in my uh, <laughs> presentation at all. Um, thank you, Rick. Um, the special relationship. So the special relationship, as I see it, to this particular place is how the English, and I'm going to take a little bit of uh, um, exception, the British colonial America, let's call it what uh, it is. My yeah. Scottish mother would not be happy. She's unhappy enough with me anyway, having born an English son as a result of her, her um, uh, partner. Um, so let's, let's talk about the English, because it was the English, and importantly, um, um, as we've been looking at different components of this, Angolans, Africans, um, let, let's, let's burn down on that. Um, that special relationship between the servitude that was absolute, um, concentrated in, in England, uh, and how in founding English North America, here in Virginia, uh, we created a special relationship that becomes expressed through race-based slavery. What was England in 1600? It was a state-mandated Protestant church state with a sizable Catholic minority. It was a poor, weak, backward state on the edge of Europe, a Europe dominated by Spain and by Portugal and the, the Catholic countries of, of the middle uh, part of Europe. It was ruled by bankrupt monarchs who distributed monopolies to court favorites. This is what it was. It wasn't a whole bunch of six foot two cavaliers with their fine um, uh, hats walking uh, uh, up on beaches. It was a bankrupt, backward state. And that's, that's who came. And not only is, um, was the state that way, but it sent its poorest and its weakest, forced them, as Rick has already told you. What was West Africa in 1600? We've already been told it's polytheistic, it was a mature trading uh, partner with many parts of the strongest parts of Europe, and it already had um, um, relationships back to the most powerful Christian um, denomination in Europe. It had a deep set of experiences that it then transferred uh, in tropical farming. There's no tropics in England. Those of you that have traveled there, you know you're bringing your winter coat for the summer. <laughs> so starting an English empire, starting an English empire with the conditions that we, we see up here, not the capital that was already forming in Holland, the main mercantile capital of Europe, 100 years behind Spain and Portugal, didn't have the trading relationships, didn't have the um, um, naval uh, capacity to move across the oceans, it had smaller, much smaller population than Spain, and it had one, only one city that had more than 20,000 people living it. That was the city of London. Um, there was, in 1607, we were in the middle of a long, long time period where um, wages had been suppressed over 65 years, those wages being suppressed to, were bringing people into the, uh, the towns and in particular into London. So uh, very poor, unskilled population. There had been huge um, concerns about that, that uh, labor force leading to different uh, laws uh, that required uh, people to both be registered, to um, um, be part of the, um, the, the system of, of labor management. And, We'll see how that plays out as well. We had one colonial possession, one colonial possession, and that was Ireland. And that had been conquered uh, some 40 years before, and conquered is probably the right word. But this was not a particularly uh, difficult group to uh, conquer, perhaps um, uh, other people with uh, different backgrounds can argue uh, more about that. But it did prove that one colonial uh, possession to have one, one thing that we would need to bring forward. The English had developed the concept of the plantation, of a land-based distribution to an elite 
but would then manage the process on those uh, plantations of poor peasants. Now that we understand when we think about the last 400 years, why the plantation was important. So when the English Empire comes to America, we had second mover advantage. We were lift to Spain's Uber. Spain had brought disease. Spain had effectively reduced the population that England would encounter in this part of the world, the native population, by over 50%. By bringing uh, the smallpoxes, by bringing the measles, by bringing the uh, um, diseases of um, uh, Europe, they had so undermined the, um, um, the local populations that England had other uh, advantages by coming to this particular geography. Rick was, was in his presentation talking about integration, globalization. This concept of the transfer of biology is one to think about. The cultural transformations that come by bringing uh, people, by bringing plants, but more so by bringing disease is profound in terms of giving that English empire a, a chance to, to take root. Unlike Spain and Portugal, the English empire was founded with the idea of ridding its cities, ridding its uh, land of the excess labor. Uh, so was less interested in enslaving, putting to work the native population. Uh, we don't have time to go into it, but the, the amount of um, interaction the English had with the native population was much less than both the Spanish and the uh, Portuguese did in, uh, when they were um, 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 setting up their empire. And the model was this Irish plantation system. So Virginia was, as Rick has, has pointed out uh, in his presentation, this was the colony to take care of the unneeded, the unwanted of England. English life, labor, and, and idleness. It, life in England was um, described by the, the great philosopher Hobbes as nasty, short, and brutish. This wasn't the uh, master race theater uh, presentation back, Pride and Prejudice, and uh, um, what we see on PBS on a Sunday afternoon. This was a place you had to work hard, you had to uh, um, expect um, many of your children to die in, in birth, and again, you were living in this wet and unproductive uh, land at the very edge of Europe. There was no Mediterranean diet back there that was brought in from uh, uh, global commerce. From the Black Death onwards, England, England had series of laws that uh, legislated against uh, idleness. Uh, and those same laws were the ones that were pushing uh, the London Company to begin its part of uh, taking care of the excess labor in, in England and, and send them across to um, what became the United States. The 200 years before uh, the founding of the English Empire, the guilds, apprenticeship, and indentured systems uh, developed and they progressed uh, and then were, were uh, finally realized in some of the, uh, um, the movement here to, to, uh, to Americas. The adaptation of English labor to America isn't exactly a story of great heroism. It's, that isn't the one that we're, we're, um, um, we've been talking about as learning. They were unable to feed themselves. They, just as the failed um, um, Empire um, earlier down south in, in North Carolina, um, this group were desperate to see that ship come over the horizon with another bag of food. This was not a group that knew how to feed themselves um, based uh, upon the skills that they had collected and based upon the managerial capacity and all of the other things it takes to, to build a culture. However, in 1614, we now had a new opportunity came about through that first cash crop uh, from tobacco. That meant that we had more um, activity going back and forth. It meant that there was now a way to trade, but again to trade 
for the food that might be imported uh, back to, um, um, to bringing new convicts in 1615. Again, English looking to colonize this land with other English, not use the already existing slaving system that uh, Spain and Portugal had. However, as, as we've already heard from, from Rick and, and Evelyn, the, the piracy, the ability to disrupt this enemy of England, this, this Spanish um, empire, did um, attract a number of the adventurers, the, the very same name that uh, goes in the founding of the London Company. They are the adventurers. These are the seafaring people who will be happy to take gold off of the uh, gold, silver, and uh, any other contraband off of the hands of the Spanish if they can. Those, those uh, skilled laborers that uh, would have allowed an English empire to, pro uh, to be produced by English labor were not brought out here. Um, Rick told you all the reasons why. However, six times more land-seeking gentry, the people used to owning the land in England, came to these United States, to this very particular spit of land, in the hopes that they would get more land. They were driven by that ambition. Um, they just didn't understand what it was going to take to actually make that land productive. It wasn't going to be um, through the people that they could uh, impress from London or from other parts of uh, um, the rural England. We've, we've covered the Middle Passage. I would emphasize uh, the, the original intent in the English, uh, the, of the English can be expressed to some extent by the fact that it didn't get even, even after having brought Africans in bondage in 1619 to these shores, they didn't begin the process of working the slave system with the same uh, uh, level of intensity until a lot later, until 1680, an important date obviously in Virginia history. But of the um, 16 slave trip ships that were brought uh, to the United States, or what we now call the United States, there were only 16 out of the over 30,000. Uh, 12 of those did come to Virginia, two to uh, New York and one each to Massachusetts and, and Maryland. So this is, 60 years later, this was not a large um, part of the creation of the English Empire. Um, it, it did become, and obviously, the, you know, the huge amount of capital that became uh, the, the transporting of bodies, black bodies in particular around the United States, um, came, came quickly there on as, as that um, system got uh, um, able to, to capture more of that wealth. There's very little, um, if any, description of any of the black um, um, and Africans as slaves. This wasn't the term that was used. Um, a slave, as Rick's already gone over, was a non-believer, an infidel, uh, and it wasn't even understood that you could be a slave if you were a Christian, with the Protestant Catholic piece of that um, um, being important too. So in many ways, I would argue the Africans were saviors, they were skilled, they were polytheistic, they were, in, they were capable of, of bringing themselves and finding a way to um, make their lives and save the lives of other people around them. Um, the unfree labor, Yes, but that was also true of everyone uh, else uh, that came impressed by English um, um, gentry and the, the capitalists of London. So a side-by-side -side comparison shows that Africans were more Catholic than the English Protestants, skilled artisans as opposed to um, unskilled labor. We don't know enough about the literacy, or I don't know enough about the literacy, but most of the English that came would be illiterate. illiterate. Most of the uh, English would be indentured in England and, and further indentured here. And their adaptation to the tropics, the diseases, and the other things was none, if not limited. So to me, there are a number of unanswered questions. I hope we get uh, to questions quickly. Um, uh, what, what was, uh, th these are all the things that quickly occurred to me. And I want to also make one quick um, um, uh, note of a, a book, because I couldn't have stood up here and not talk about a book. Like, um, no, I could. But um, it's, it's th this particular place, and as I was, I was sharing with the, the council member, is as important to 
the most hallowed piece of ground here, both in Virginia but in the United States, of Arlington, because so many of the over 3,000 civilians that are buried in Section 27 of Arlington Cemetery are from this very spit of land here. By getting, walking into Fort Monroe, three Africans, African Americans, um, under them, the, uh, the, the freedom that was given to them by the, uh, the Union Army, would make the passage up this spit of land to Washington. Um, thousands upon thousands would move to Washington during the Civil War. So many people then died in that, uh, um, in that um, movement to that city that their, their burial could only happen. There, there it goes, there's, there's, the, there's the bell. Um, so we, st we stand here um, in Hampton. It is the, uh, it is the first place that uh, Africans arrived, uh, reported to arrive, but it's also in, a, an essential part of uh, a piece of history that Rick and I got a chance to write about as well. Thank you very much for the time. I look forward to uh, Good afternoon. Uh, before I get started, let me just introduce two people. Uh, all of you are important, but let me just introduce two people. Uh, two gentlemen who have supported Project 1619 and the history of the Africans for many, many years. Our mayor from the city of Hampton, Mr. Donnie Tuck. And our vice mayor, Mr. Donnie Thank you for your support. Um, I want to thank you for being here today because you could be a flat beer festival. It's ironic that we're here today talking about how pirates brought our ancestors here. And today there is a black beer pirate festival going on. So, today they want me to talk about connecting Point Comfort in Fort Monroe. And if you grew up in this area, you know there's a Point Comfort, there's a New Point Comfort, there's an Old Point Comfort, there's a Fort Monroe. So my task today is to try to connect those dots. This, um, so when we talk about um, Point Comfort, we go back to the original map that was drawn by uh, Captain John Smith. Now, he drew this map using a boat. So it's not geographically correct. Uh, he did, did not have an airplane. He could not fly over the property. So this is his drawing of the area using a boat. In his original map, you see where they show Point Comfort. But the story really begins in April of 1607, and that's where I want to go back and talk to about 1607. We know that in April, the Susan Constant, the Godspeed, and the Discovery entered the Chesapeake Bay. They wanted to found the land on behalf of England. And they pulled into a land that we call today Virginia Beach. Now, the Native Americans at Virginia Beach saw them coming, and they went and hid. The settlers sent out a scouting party which in a little boat we call a shallow. They arrived at Virginia Beach. They see no inhabitants. They take a flag, and they get ready to stake it in the ground on behalf of England, and all broke loose. The Native Americans Americans came by and attacked them, shot one of the commanders in the chest and killed them. They steered back to their little shallow boats and got on their ship and said, well, that didn't work out too well. And then they said, well, let's cross over the channel and we see more land. They crossed over the channel and they come to what we call today Hampton. But as they approached Hampton, they found this deep water. Captain said, we can easily bring our ships into this deep water, so let's call this uh, Cape Comfort. Um, so the original name that they came up with was Cape Comfort. As the ship rounded a little island, and then Port Comfort, uh, they came across a little island on the outskirts of what we call today Phoebus. This was a little small island, no more than 63 acres. 
When they approached this little island, the captain said, okay, we've got Cape Comfort. Let's call this point of land Point Comfort. Point Comfort was a small island that was inhabited by the Native Americans in the summertime as a fishing village. This is April. There was nobody fishing in April. So the captain says, okay, let's round Point Comfort and go into the inlet and see what we see. When they rounded Point Comfort, they came to what? Kikitan Indian Village. But it was a different story. The Kikitan Indians were sitting there with their bows and arrows ready to attack. The settlers dropped their swords and dropped their guns and they put their hands over their heart. And the Native Americans said, this must be a peaceful venture. They, they then swam out and helped bring the shallow boats into the Kikitan Indian Village. Now, this was pretty much a time where the Native Americans had eaten all of their food storage in the winter. They had barely any food to spare, but yet they brought these settlers into their village and they fed them. The, the settlers then decided to take a tour of the area and they started going along the sand dunes and they came across the strawberry patch. Strawberry, as they said, were three to four times larger than any strawberry they had seen in England. So what did they call it? Strawberry banks, which is still strawberry banks today. They went a little further inland and they saw thousands of acres of corn. So let me go back to April 30th. People don't recognize that the settlers stayed in the Kikadan Indian village for 12 days. Nobody's going to tell you that. The settlers sent out a scouting party to try to find out this land that they could settle to call a place called Jamestown. They sent out scouting parties to Jamestown or up to Richmond area, up the York River, all the way down up to Maryland. And they came back and they told the captains, the best place that we have found to establish this settlement is like Rick said, this mosquito infested marshland that they settled and they called Jamestown after King James. So then we move forward to 1619 and the landing of the first Africans. We know the ship arrived here at that time it was called Point Comfort. And it amazes me today of all the information that's still out there that people still refer to it as Old Point Comfort. It was called Point Comfort. It was documented in the letter by John Rolfe, where he documented the landing or arrival of the first 20 and odd Africans at Point Comfort. So there is no confusion over the name of Point Comfort. So when we start talking about New Point Comfort, in the 1630s, up around Matthews County, what we call Mob Jack Bay, there was a new settlement formed, and they called it New Point Comfort. Now the people at Point Comfort said, well, we're first, we'll change our name to Old Point Comfort. But the name Old Point Comfort didn't catch on. As late as 1705, people were still in call Point Comfort, Point Comfort. The name of Old Point Comfort did not catch on. Gradually in the 1700s, people found and started calling it Old Point Comfort. So when we move on to the 1860s, now when I talked earlier about Point Comfort was a little small island. This is a an illustration because there was no camera at that time here. This is an illustration of how small Point Comfort was. This is a picture taken in the early 1860s of just how small Point Comfort was. You can see that Point Comfort encompassed almost the entire island. So then we move forward until the 1800s, when we start talking about the 
creation of the Fort Monroe. In 1890, President James Monroe decided that there needed to be better fortification in the Hampton Roads area. He wanted to set up a network of defenses. So in 1822, they started the development and construction of Fort Monroe. And we all know that Fort Monroe was built partly with enslaved African labor. We know that in 1834, the fort was finally constructed or finished, and they decided to name it Fort Monroe after the U.S. President James Monroe. So when we look at the map today, comparing that to the map of the 1860s, you can see that most of the area that we're standing on today and most of the area surrounding the moat is man-made. Uh, most of the, the area that we're looking at was barged in with landfill or field material. We've gone from 63 acres up to over 500 acres. So when we talk about Old Point Comfort, we need to realize that we are at Old Point Comfort. The land mass is called Old Point Comfort. It's not called Fort Monroe. Fort Monroe is built on top of Old Point Comfort. So the land mass is still Old Point Comfort with the National Monument or the moat being Fort Monroe. So we go back to 2011 when President Barack Obama declared Fort Monroe National Monument. And in that declaration or proclamation, he said, and this is where the first Africans landed in 1619. So like Rick and everybody else is telling you, the documentation is there. Uh, we just need to keep repeating it, hopefully with one day people will recognize that what we've been telling them for all these years is the truth. So um, that was just a brief overview of how we got from Point Comfort to New Point Comfort to Old Point Comfort. Thank you for your attention. for our panel. I have a question for Colin. Um, yeah. Colin, how, um, how did the um, point comfort, the new point comfort uh, um, communities connect? We don't know how they connected. It was a strange phenomenon that you would have all the names that you could come up with, knowing that there was a point comfort and then you're going to call yourself New Point Comfort. So evidently there was some dissension between the people in Matthews County and the people here in present day Hampton on what they named themselves. So, but nobody really defined where the name came from and why they decided to use it. And that's a, a reason why there's a lot of confusion today over that, the naming of New Point Comfort. If it wasn't for New Point Comfort, we'd still be Point Comfort. <laughs> And I had a question, I guess, for Dr. Mizell and Mr. Stevens, um, in particular about, so I always think it's interesting, because you mentioned Alado Equiano, and I've read his narrative, I love it, um, and just this understanding of the English, and when we talk about the Middle Passage, I think that people think it's one way, but there's this whole other narrative, like, you know, Alado Equiano gets free and spends the rest of his life in England, and there are all these other kind of narratives where places like Barbados, which means that people didn't land in Virginia, but they might have landed in Barbados and then gone to South Carolina, gone to Virginia, gone back to Africa, gone to back to England. And this backward slave trade of Native Americans um, to uh, England and Europe, which I think nobody ever talks about. So I was interesting, how, how does that uh, work into the 1619 narrative, um, this sort of larger story of all these other colonies and this sort of backward, uh, I guess, migration to England? Where'd it go? <laughs> she didn't make me <laughs> you're, you're right, um, that these, 
the voyages, the, the you know the, the migration patterns. Um, you know that it's 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 wide ranging, um, and you know the more you look into it, you can see that there are so many um, uh, stories that we are we, we just don't know about. And this is one of the reasons why uh, we started Sons and Daughters is because of these different. Um, stories that come out of these different migration patterns and that uh, if you look into your ancestry you can see this pattern. So one of the things that um, I have found when, with my own uh, studies of my own genealogy, um, looking at the DNA, I have cousins that um, are showing up in England. Mm -hmm. And so I, called this, I contacted this cousin, I said, how'd you get to England? And um, he told me that he came from um, it's Jamaica, came from Jamaica. I don't have family in Jamaica. So, so what happened, as you, as you mentioned, that many of these people came from um, you know, ports in Africa and they were dropped off uh, maybe in Jamaica and, and uh, maybe the mother uh, was taken on to uh, the United States. And so, uh, so, so you have these different patterns and you have this. And so, uh, so you, you bring up a really, really good point about how uh, you know this this narrative needs to be expanded, and, and we, we need to put much more to that to those poems. There's another aspect of it as well, um, <clears throat> and we don't want to come across that we're repeating the same stuff over and over again. But most of the Africans came with skills, mm -hmm. and many of them, when they were on the slave ships continued to learn skills. And many of them found their ways going from different ports because many of them became navigators or they worked the ships. So it was not unusual for Africans to be dropped off in any of the ports along the East Coast and some of them staying on the ships um, going to other ports. You, it raised the question about the 1619 narrative. We know that the treasurer only left one person behind. We also know that when the ship went to Bermuda, because of the controversy, some of those Africans who went to Bermuda found their way to England, and when the Privy Council began to conduct an investigation on behalf of the ambassador of Spain and the King of England, they were brought here. And some will argue that that was actually the longest middle passage because they went from Africa to Jamaica to off the coast of New Spain, Mexico, to Virginia, to Bermuda, to England, back here. So you saw a lot of voyages like that where not all got off the ship. Some of them went different places. So our history is a very, very rich history. And I want to talk another point that Tim had mentioned, maybe you can expand on it. <clears throat> when England looked at the colony as a place to send its poor, it never looked at the Virginia colony as a place for Africans to work. So when you hear people say they brought the Africans here to work, that was not in the original plan they had enough cheap labor to work here. It was an accident that those two ships happened to come here and they brought the Africans here. So that was not part of the larger design. So it's very important that we understand that. So when you hear people say they brought them here to work, no, they brought them here because they needed food and they wanted to trade them for food. They didn't trade them for money because the colony here was a failed colony. They had no money to pay them for. Uh, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Hi, Rick. Um, I'm Ren I'm, I, I think everyone can hear me, right? No. Okay, I'm Renata Yarbrough Sanders. I was a member of Odds here in Hampton, and I grew up here in Hampton. And I'm just going to say I'm a retired educator, two years out of um, the system, but I still tutor. And this year I've been tutoring a fourth grader, which is the year here in this area that they get their Virginia studies. 
And I have been very impressed with what this young lady that I tutor, you know, I see her, her work every, every week. I see her curriculum for social studies, for Virginia studies. All of this is being covered. Um, I, what I see is that the curriculum is being updated as more of this information is being um, made available, publicized, and there seems to be a commitment on the state, part of the state of Virginia, and specifically in Newport News, where um, I'm most familiar with the curriculum, to get the right information to today's students. And so I just want to say that because we hear a lot of criticism about what's being taught in the schools or outliers who are doing things like, you know, having black kids on this side. Well, remember, when you're doing the right thing, it doesn't make news. So when you're hearing about these very isolated situations, that's not what's happening in most classrooms. But I just wanted to say that because I've been very impressed this year um, seeing what she's learning and what is has been added and is being um, covered by the Virginia SOLs. And Newport News has its own additional kind of supplement to that in their curriculum. So I just wanted to know that your work is not um, being done in vain. Everything that you all are doing, um, the articles that we have in our local paper, the Daily Press, almost, it seems like every day, I know it's not, but there are lots of articles being published that are giving this information and educating the public. So just, I appreciate it, and I want you to know that the school system, at least in Virginia, is, is trying to keep up. And you know, Renata, I think that's a very important thing um, and we're going to talk a little bit about education later on. Um, I think it's very important that we hear that. Um, and, and I want to change it a little bit, but I want to come back to it. We saw, those of us who live here in Virginia, we saw what happened to our own governor not too long ago and the whole controversy um, about him. And, and I'm not here to discuss that. What I would like to discuss, however, is when he was on TV, and he tried to explain his understanding of the first documented Africans and the uproar that that caused that Saturday morning. And what he was trying to communicate is what's being done here in Virginia to make sure that once and for all, Virginians begin to understand this history. It's a hard history to understand. Um, many of our own people of color have questioned it want documentation for it, but I think people are beginning to understand it. And I know that afternoon I get a lot of calls from MSNBC and all the stations, and when you begin to explain it to them, it begins to make sense. The challenge now is how do we take this nationwide? Because this has an important historical aspect because once and for all, we can make sure that our history is being taught correctly. Who we are as a people can be taught correctly. And our children should not be holding their heads in shame when you have other people who are teaching it incorrectly. So I take my hat off to the governor. He got beaten up for that particular segment. But more and more, more, and more of us need to stand up. And last night at dinner, we talked about some of us who stand up, how our lives are being threatened, how we're being challenged, how we're being told we don't know what we're talking about. And I guess this is what you have to go through when you help people go through this paradigm shift. But it's important that more of us become ambassadors like the folks here, because Tim's telling you how England never thought about bringing black people here to be workers because they had so many poor people to do that. Or when Evelyn tells you about the voices of where they came from. Or when Calvin stands up and is being threatened and challenged by people because he's telling stories that are not true. This is important to us. So with that, I think... Uh, uh, yeah, I just, you reminded me of one other thing I wanted to add. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not... You all. I'm, I'm small scale, but I, who I talk to, they hear the right thing. And what I wanted to say is that um, 
this experience, I've been tutoring, I've taught for 32 years and I always tutored, so that's not a new experience. But the experience of working with a fourth grader who has this particular curriculum, this young lady is Asian. And so it's very different, um, a different perspective that I know I'm giving to her that she's not going to hear from anywhere else because of how I can add to what she's learning and she's not going to hear that from her teacher. And a lot of times the delivery or the, the deliverer makes the difference, just as in Jamestown. Um, I've been taking children to Jamestown for 25 years at least, and I've never heard anything presented the way you said it was presented to you yesterday. But it's about who that person was that was standing in front of you. Because just as I may add to what I'm, you know, teaching or tutoring, that person is, is adding their lack of knowledge to what they're telling people. So that makes a difference, too. And, That's and, it, I'm finished. <laughs> and folks always say, don't give Rick a microphone. <laughs> but I'm so happy that you mentioned that as well, that the young lady was Asian. Because we honor their culture because they learn from their elders. We forget that in our African heritage, we learn from our elders. And since most of us are baby boomers, it's now important as the elders that we make sure that our children understand this. So when they see Tarzan like I did, they know better. When they see Gone with the Wind, they realize that's a romanticized version of what slavery was all about. We are now the elders. Let's go out and speak. Yes, sir. You're keeping this microphone in front of me. Yes. <laughs> They're not coming up to the mic. That's what I'm saying. You need to repeat it. I, I, I believe the answer is yes. Um, in my research, I have not done that kind of research. But yes, there were Africans who lived in England prior to the 1600s. Yes, sir. You getting them to come to the mic? Can I address that a little bit? They were. Can you come to the microphone, please, yeah. sir? Yeah. So that everybody can hear you. Can you get ready to okay. impart some important sure. information? <laughs> That'll work. My name is uh, Shelton Tucker. Mm. Uh, here. Oh, you want the Tuckers? Yes. <laughs> I've been uh, dying to meet you guys. <laughs> Um, I've done some research, and quite a bit of research. Uh, the, there were a group of Africans that came from the area called Sharma in what is now Ghana. Uh, they came to England in 1555. Uh, they came there, the problem with a lot of historians, as soon as they see an African, they assume they were slaves. They were not. They were actually ambassadors because they were actually named, and later on in Heckler's uh, chronicles of his voyages, uh, two of them came back and returned uh, so that they could start trading with England in 1555. Uh, the names that were mentioned were uh, Benny, uh, Benny, uh, George, and Anthony. Uh, the name Anthony is significant because during my time, I spent, I lived over in England for about five years. One of the patterns that Africans did, they always anglicized their names. And let me, let me tell you, I had a discussion. I was a banker in England, and I never forget, I had a European banker to tell me they never give an account to anybody's name that ended in an A or an O. Mm -mm. Okay? Because they were typically Nigerian names that ended in the, those letters. Great. So Ni Nigerians always ended up anglicizing their names in order to transact business. Okay? The same thing happened here. Also, uh, there were several, there was an Englishman, several Englishmen specifically named in the Earl Rich Papers. Uh, he was sent, his name was James. He was sent over from England to start an experimental crop in Bermuda, in Southampton. Uh, those Africans actually were investors in that experimental crop. And this was in 1612. Uh, 
if you look in, in detail about the seafaring Africans, you will find that a lot of them, as you mentioned in your studies, were multilingual. Uh, they were recruited by the Earl of Warwick to start an experimental crop in Southampton in Bermuda. And the first actual law against Negroes was in 1623. You really have to look at the Virginia Company from an investment group perspective. The Virginia Company of London had a splinter side group called the Bermuda or Summers Island, mm -hmm. but they were the same investors for the most part. Okay? No one tells, I, I'm, I'm in the uh, process of doing a book, I know it's too long, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I, I just want to answer your question. That was a good question uh, because there were blacks in England. Right. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Mandy, you want yeah, to come up? Yeah, I'm right. And again, mm -hmm. I'll give you two minutes. Then, then, then. No, I'll do sure. I can do it in two minutes. Okay, thank you, Mandy. My concern is always that we often get stuck in this timeline, meaning that uh, we are now hearing an awful lot about slavery, then the Civil War, but very little about Reconstruction and the period after Reconstruction. I was reminded when the um, educator earlier talked about uh, the history of fourth graders. I too am a retired educator in the city of Hampton. I taught third grade history. Then I tutored fourth grade history. And in the fourth grade history, well, in the third grade history, it's all glamorized about the city of Hampton. Then you get to the fourth grade, and there's a minute part about black codes in Virginia. Now, then after the black codes, not getting stuck there, but we don't know too much about that. We don't publish very much about that. Then we get to massive resistance, uh, separate but equal, and then civil rights. But there is so much left out that we do not know. The Reconstruction period was even more devastating, or as devastating, as um, pre-Civil War. So I'm hoping that we're not going to really get stuck in the timeline, that we will continue it and give as much emphasis and research and study as we are doing to the period that we have here. And I thank whoever says we were saviors. I never heard that word. <laughs> I love that. And on that note, we'll take a five minute break and we'll come back at exactly 3 30. Thank you all. While many of you were held up your phones to take pictures, there were no phones or cameras in 1619. So we really don't know what things looked like then. And what's most interesting is our knowledge comes from pictures. And what Catherine did is she commissioned an artist to take a picture of the San Juan Bautista, or draw a picture of the San Juan Bautista when it was being attacked by the two English ships, the treasurer and the white lion. So I hope before you leave, you take an opportunity to come by and look at that oil that she had commissioned, because that kind of tells you the story. But more important, most of you have a connection to that ship, the San Juan Bautista, because that is the ship that took your African, your Angolan ancestors from Africa, and the White Lion and the Treasurer are the ships that brought us here. But Catherine's going to share with you a story of who some of these people are, and I hope you'll find it most interesting. Now, I'm glad you all enjoy when you hear the chimes in the background, because Catherine has so much information that I hope I don't cut her short before she really gets to the height of this, um, but I think you're going to enjoy Catherine. Joe, that's my husband. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Today I want to talk 
talk about who were the first Africans. For 400 years, we only have known what John Rock wrote in the letter in January of 1624, months after they arrived. And they were called the 20 and on. They've been called that for 400 years. But today, I'm going to name them. Um, but I want to go back. The San Juan Batista, when they arrived, um, or the, when the Africans from the San Juan Batista arrived, the first documentation we have is from um, February of 1623, and it is the list of the living and dead. And from that, in the census of 1624 and 25, I've compiled a list of 29 Africans and their names. But I'm going to go through this list and name every one of them, and we're going to give them a last name and who they were. So here we go. Um, the first ones that we find is, in the census, is Anthony and Isabella Tucker. They are the ancestors of Shelton over here. <laughs> um, I've talked with Shelton very much, and we've worked with his DNA and so on, but we'll get to that later. But they were known as the first family of Virginia, the first African family of Virginia. William was their son, who was born sometime between 1623 and 24. He was, not, he was the first African child baptized in Virginia. And I want to say that being baptized, it's been a misconception to this day about he was the first child born in, Afri in America, but that is not factual. Because on the 1623 list of the living, we have a woman named as a African woman with young child of hers. And that precedes William's birth, precedes William's birth. But I want to start with those, when they were brought here, those 14 Africans originally on the White Lion, half of them went to Abraham Pierce's plantation and half of them went to Governor Yardley's. These six Africans were at Abraham Pierce's plantation. The first one was named Anthony. It was John, William, Anthony, an unnamed woman, and the woman with the young child of hers. All of these were listed um, at Abraham's Pierce's plantation. But who are they really? We only have four first names, and the women don't even have a name. But by later documents that we find in the public records, in these counties, we can put these names back together. So the puzzle comes back together. So Anthony, the first one, at Abraham Pierce's plantation, Anthony becomes Tony King. He married a woman named Sarah, who actually had a daughter named Sarah also, and we end up finding her on the, the eastern shore in Virginia. Um, the second Anthony that was listed, he becomes Anthony Longo. And Anthony Longo actually was one of the very first Africans that we find that was free without indenture. And that was in 1635. He was released by his master, and his master says it was, it was from a documented, from thine own hand that it was written. <clears throat> Next we have John. John became John Fernando. He also ends, ends up on the Eastern Shore, and he was married to a woman by the name of Christian. Um, the woman with the young child of hers, we I, I identify later from, from later records. Her name was Frances, and her son was Peter. Um, and then I want to go to William and then the unnamed African. Those two that were left, we lose track of William. He is not documented. I cannot, he is one of the only men that I cannot give a name, a last name to. And then there was an unnamed woman. I later on will talk about the women, and we, I have very little information because, of course, the women were not named as much as the men in the public records. Now, at Captain Williams Ewan's plantation, which was also called the College Lane in Surrey County, we had four Africans. We had Michael, Catherine, John, and Matthew. Now, Michael and Catherine, they lived, they came in 60, I believe they probably came in 1620. They returned on um, from the Africans that were taken to Bermuda on the treasure. They re returned in some way, whether it was on the treasure, a barge, or how they returned, we cannot say. Um, the treasure still did exist in Bermuda later on, so we're not exactly sure of how they returned from Bermuda back to Virginia. Um, in 1624 20, and 23, 25, they are not listed in the muster. And the reason I bring that up is because I find them later on in the land patents. And when they are, the land patents were renewed, they have them there all the way to current day, and they were one of the earliest ones that were there. 
Now they had at least five children. Michael married Catherine, they were both on the same plantation. They took the last name of Blizzard. Blizzard still live in Surrey County till today. I met some a couple years ago that were the direct descendants from them. Um, they had five children, Rebecca, Francis, Amos, and Susanna, and then in one of the documents, there's the fifth child was unnamed, I'm assuming it was very young. Also on that plantation was John Gowan, who I descend from, who Rick descends from, Shelly, um, I don't see her, but she also, Shelly Murphy, she also descends from him. There's several people that descend from him. He is very unique because he actually managed to maneuver through the legal system and he became what I, some people call a bailiff, some people call him a clerk, he was a magistrate. He had the ability to maneuver and help people through the court system. He had at least two children. His first child was Mahill, who he, the mother of his child was Margaret, who also is a, I descend from. My husband also descends from her, but not through the um, John Gowan line. It, she actually ended up having um, an affair with a white, um, he was a servant on the same plantation that she was. They end up having four children, and my husband descends from that union. I descend from her first union with John Gowan, so it's, it's kind of a twisted thing. <laughs> Your cousin. Um, Matthew is also listed on the plantation of William Adams. We do not know his last name, and he disappears from the records. Now, we have Anthony and Mary Johnson. They are probably the most talked about Angolans that came to America. They are the most recognized. Anthony actually arrived back from England. He was taken to Bermuda. Um, he actually arrives, they went from Bermuda to England. They come back from England in 1621. He arrived on the James. The James was the Earl of Warwick ship. And he is the one that took him and had him brought into Bermuda. And then he was sent here once. Anthony was, was taken to Bermuda to testify um, on Robert Rich's behalf at Earl of Warwick. When that didn't go well, he was immediately sent back on his ship back to Virginia. They had to get him out of Virginia because he was going to tell the truth about the piracy. And it was trying to be totally hidden. Um, in 1638, both Anthony and Mary are listed as head rights. In 1651, they patent 250 acres. That patent was had, again, two European servants on the patent um, as head rights. So Anthony and Johnson had European head rights. 1651, um, excuse me, right there. At least, he had at least four children. There was two girls and two boys, John, Richard, Joan, and we do not know the other daughter's name. Um, at the Neck of the Land, which was north of Jamestown, we had Edward. Edward becomes Edward Mozingo. He um, had a son also named Edward Mozingo and a grandson named Edward. Now, the grandson actually married a woman by the name of Sarah Grinstead, who was the granddaughter of Elizabeth Key, who had found her freedom through baptism and having an European mother in 1629. And, but that route of being becoming free diminished when they changed the laws, of course, to outlaw that, so that that couldn't continue. Um, in, in, this is Jamestown's claim to fame as Angela. She's listed as Angelo. Um, it, she was a woman, so we're assuming it's Angela, but there is a lot of, of interest in, in belief that her name actually was Angola, and they just misspelled the names. She did come from Angola. She lived at William Pierce's residence in 1623 and 24. She actually, there's some question whether she went directly to Jamestown or not, because if she returned, it depends on, she got off that first ship, the treasurer, when it came through, there was one person missing or whether she returned. If she returned in 1620, she actually did not go to Jamestown first. She went to Mulberry Plantation where Mr. Pierce had his residence at that time. He returned to, to Jamestown in 1623, so she would have been there in 1623 and stayed there for the remaining of her life, probably. Um, we also have John Pedro. John Pedro also was one of the ones that went to Bermuda on the, on the treasure. He ended up in England came back, um, back to Virginia, but it, it was actually through Plymouth that he returned. He went there first and then came to Virginia. Um, he arrived on the Swan in 1623. That Swan left 
England in 1621, ended up in Plymouth, then it went to, um, came eventually here to Virginia. He was listed in Francis West's plantation. Francis West was the captain of the Swan. Now, the Africans at Governor George Darley's plantation, these are much harder to name because they were never identified with names. They were listed as African men and African women. That is it. So later on, if you go through the genealogical part of this, you can see where these people appear and how they, they come. And it's when Governor Yardley died, his will um, was probated in, in 1628. And at that point in time, those Africans, seven years later, we find them um, being released from indenture. So at that point, they either indentured themselves um, so that they would have an end date to their contract so they could have a way to find their freedom. And that's what they did. We find um, several of them, we can name at least three of the men. I'll get to the women later. Um, and Emmanuel Driggers is the first one. Emmanuel Driggers actually is very important to the first Africans because he was the very first freedom fighter. He would adopt children who did not have any legal way out of slavery or he knew it was coming. He adopted those children and then paved their way out of servitude. So they weren't, some of them weren't his. He had children that were and weren't. But that is very important. He was very much an advocate trying to pull these people and give them a way out when slavery was really coming down hard in the laws of Virginia later on. In 1637 and 1638, we find him working at Captain Francis Potts on the eastern shore. Um, he had been indentured in 1628. In 1637, he's now released. He gets married. He has children. Um, and I want to go back real quick. Emmanuel Driggers marries Frances. Frances was the woman who had the young child of hers, Peter. He marries Frances, and they adopt one of Margaret Cornish's children, one of the four that she had with the Robert Sweat, who was the European um, servant. It was both of them, we must give credit to, that they were the first freedom fighters in Virginia. Um, Bashaw Fernando, he lived, also lived on the eastern shore with Francis Potts. He had substantial holdings. He owned and traded cattle, hogs, horses, and poultry. He even had a cattle brand. Never heard that before, did you? Never knew that they had any type of cattle brand. They were cattle barons. Philip Manga, he also lived on the eastern shore. He owned a cattle ranch, and he was a superior horse breeder, the best in, the, in all of Virginia. We have Benjamin Dahl. He lived on the south side of the James River in Wands Parish, also known as Surrey County. The two gentlemen that were that could maneuver through the legal system was John Gowan and Benjamin Dahl. In the early um, 1648, 43 maybe, he was appointed as a legal representative to a white woman. In 1656, Dahl was granted 300 acres adjoining Captain Samuel, Samuel Jordan's plantation. He actually came off of Jordan's plantation. That's where he was sent originally. 1659, again, he acted as an attorney. Um, and his son was named John Dahl, and he was born about 1648. These lines go on to current day. Then we have Paul Carter. He was named a servant in the household of Nathaniel Littleton. In 1640, he was not named a slave, he was named a servant. His wife's name was Hannah, and they had four children. We can trace Thomas, the youngest child, and he ends up having three more girls. There's Francis Payne, he was also called Francisco, when he was claimed as a head right in 1637. This is how you know that we can tell where these Africans came from, is because they went they indentured themselves when they when Governor Yardley died. Actually, it was kind of it was simultaneous with um, Abraham Piercy, who owned the other Africans. Those fourteen that came, we can account for all of them. Francis, you see them coming from being indentured for seven years, then they become headwrights, and then they become property owners. Then they trade with their horses. People buy their cattle. All of this documentation is recorded 
in the Northampton County public records because most of them were on the east, the English, or the Eastern Shore. Now, when they were there, the reason they recorded is because they had to account for who bought it to make sure they were paid, the person they sold it to, whether it was their son, an Englishman, a, a native, whoever they sold that to. That information is documented and it is there. You just have to look, and the research has hardly been touched. Now, the possible women, actually, we only find four. And the four are the wives of some of the men that I just went through. We have Hannah Carter, Sarah King, Catalina Longo, and Christian Francisco. Um, Catalina Longo ends up dying very early. And Longo, Anthony Longo, I wanted to go back to what something Rick said. He actually took his name, and it's in recognition of where he came from. I have to, would have to assume he came from the kingdom of Longo, because when that kingdom was raided in um, Angola, there were many people within that kingdom, and I would assume that Anthony was from the kingdom of Longo, and he's giving that acknowledgement back and taking that last name. Um, in my book, Unveiled the 20 and Odd, I tell you how they got here. I account for all 60 of the ones that were taken off of the San Juan Batista when they were put on the two ships. I can tell you how many men, how many women are there, and I give you all that information in my book. Now, I want to go one step further. Calvin asked me, I've been working with Calvin since probably 2009, maybe, because he had something that he had written, <laughs> and it said that he, that he didn't, he wanted just the facts. Well, I had written a, so I had already spent probably four or five years, and I had written a nonfiction book on the first Africans, but I hated it. I absolutely hated it because you couldn't feel the pain that these people went through. You couldn't feel. I wanted someone, when, when they cried, I wanted you to cry. I wanted you to understand what they went through. So I wrote a whole series of fictional novels, and Calvin finally decided he liked them <laughs> because it showed the pain that they went through. You could, you could actually relate to these people, and many of us descend from them. Um, but when I met Calvin, I started, I, we started working on Project 1619, and he asked me not long ago, he goes, where are you going to go from here? What is your next step? Well, I have, on these series of novels, I have a research companion that's coming out next year, and it has, currently is 743 pages, it's going to have another 100 before I'm done, and it gives you all the genealogical information, all the historical facts, backing up the whole series of novels to make it more of a faction versus a fiction book. Now, I wanted to talk about this book real quick. Now, I know Rick told you some about it, but what I'm getting at is this book is a workbook that is going to tell everyone how to document and find yourself and document your way all the way back to those first Africans. In this book, I, we document um, Benjamin Dahl's DNA and we tell you how we got there. There's lots of charts that really is very easy to use. Um, but Calvin said, where are you going? I said, well, I think I have to go do the DNA, and I have to put this DNA together. So I've, I've, I've become the library chair for OGS. And through OGS, we want to put this library program in, in every library in the United States, every public library. You can walk in, you'll have a, um, uh, a total, you know, all the, the information, all the books that I went through, it'll be a huge collection of books, journals, of, of information that you can look at to determine how these Africans got there just like I did. Also, we want to put this documentary in there so that we can see and talk about how they got there. And then we want to do the next step is I want to have a DNA program where I can document all of these Africans' DNA because we can do it. It has been done. I've got several of that we have done. Um, and by doing that, we want to be able to have anybody that's done their DNA walk into that library, put you, upload your DNA into the system, and it'll tell you when we have this algorithm, do you relate? Are you related to these first Africans? And when you find that you are, it changes everything. It opens your eyes, and as all of y'all can see, you see me as a European woman. But I'm really not. I only have 42% European DNA, and the rest is Mediterranean, African, um, North African, there's pygmy, there's all this other DNA. And we really need to, to focus on that so that we all come together and realize we are the human race, and we are so related. At 35 generations, there's 275 billion ancestors. 
and we all relate at that point. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. All right, good afternoon. My name is Nick Gaffney, and I first want to say thanks to Rick for the invitation to come and speak with you today and all the organizers of today's panel and activity. I'll be talking today about community engagement, and in particular, the legacy of the first Africans, especially as it relates to the broader sweep of African American history. I spent nearly a decade teaching African American history at the college level, so in many ways, the, the story of the first Africans very much reigns true in the work that I do on a regular basis. In that context, uh, I really want to piggyback off of Rick's anecdote that he opened up the, the discussion with, with his experience at Jamestown, and this issue, this debate that continues to emerge between whether or not the first Africans were in fact enslaved or were the indentured servants. But in, in some level, it seems like we're splitting hairs, there's a lot of distinction and difference in those two, those two types of bonded labor, and I want to talk about that and what their example as indentured servants really means for the broader scope of African American history, and in particular, that social justice narrative that begins to anchor it. Uh, between Rick's presentation and Catherine's excellent presentation, we've got a really good feel and understanding of who the first Africans were and where they came from. But I want to talk about them within the broader scope of African American history. In many ways, the first Africans, they sit at the foundation of a revisionist history, right? African American history as a revisionist history of the American historical narrative. Going back to 1882, it's one of the earliest uh, works of African American history written by George Washington Williams, The History of the Negro Race in America from 1619 to 1880. From our earliest work, the story of the first Africans actually sit right at that narrative. African American history continued to evolve as an institution. In 1911, we have author Arthur Schomburg founding the Negro Society for Historical Research, uh, in many ways the, the seedbed for the Schomburg Foundation in New York City today. In 1917, we have Carter G. Woodson, uh, one of our famous early 20th century African American historians, found what would become the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. But the 1960s in particular really saw a blossoming of African American history, largely tied to civil rights and black power activists, working to propel the African American historical narrative into the mainstream of collegiate and secondary education. And that's where we really want to talk about this idea of social justice coming into the framework here. Many ways, when it comes to teaching uh, black history, African American history on the collegiate level, it's very much rooted in the black power values, the philosophy of self determination, uh, the idea of cultural self awareness. In many ways, black power and civil rights activists saw the idea of teaching African American history to young African American students, uh, members of the African American community, as an important weapon in the struggle for freedom, uh, the struggle for self determination within the United States. In many ways, they begin to build an organized narrative around the corrective power of the truth, right? What was the nature of the true experience of African Americans in the United States relative to what was being taught in the schools at that moment in time? This kind of speaks to the question you discussed me earlier about what fourth graders are learning with in Virginia's curriculum today. When you look at the chronology and timeline of the civil rights and black power era, you saw the springboard, if you will, for collegiate education coming in the 1960s. Here's just a, a quick image from the 1968 rally in the Student Union at San Francisco State University, which is one of the first areas you see an effort to fight and bring uh, African American education uh, into the college classroom. That's happening in a, the exact moment in time in which you see images like this framing how the history of African Americans is being taught to students within Virginia. And what we're looking at here is an image uh, that comes from a textbook used within the Virginia State curriculum. Uh, Virginia, History, Government, Geography by Francis Simpkins, uh, Spotswood Jones, and Simon Poole, published in 1957, but still widely used in the 1970s. In the very moment in time when you see black power and civil rights activists advocating, if you will, uh, for teaching African American history in its true form. And when you look at this image, right, the idea that a picture is worth a thousand words, what does this tell you about the nature of the African American experience? at this, this formative moment of, it, of its inception, right? Think about that 1619 moment, right? What does this narrative communicate to you? The circumstance of their arrival, if you will. The idea of, of a well-dressed family shaking hands with the, the captain of the slaver. Uh, the nature of the relationship that exists between these two individuals, right? Between the two men shaking hands on, on board. The nature of the experience they're about to embark upon. In many ways, this, 
presented a really a false narrative, right? This idea that slavery uh, for African Americans and people of African descent uh, was a positive, was a was an enriching experience by coming into contact with the Europeans who helped to civilize and elevate them on the scale of civilization. Right? This is the narrative that's being taught to within the public schools at this moment in time, in which you see black power activists working to correct and begin to revise this narrative. But what, what are the consequences, right? What are the larger consequences of really pretending, going along with that image, that slavery was a happiest and prosperous institution for people of African descent? A measure against the reality of contemporary racial disparities, right? The talk about social justice issues that still exist within the United States today. The idea that there's a great disparity in the, the level of college graduation rates between white Americans and black Americans. 22.8% for African Americans versus 42.1% uh, for European Americans. Uh, poverty rate disparity when it comes to 21.8% for African Americans living below the poverty line versus 8.8% of European Americans. The idea that African Americans are 6.4 times more likely to be incarcerated for a crime compared to white American counterparts. Uh, the black infant mortality rate being double the size for white infants relative to African American infants. What does that mean, reconciled against the history that was being taught within the public schools at that moment in time, in which the story of the original 20 and all was being framed as, a, as this kind of happy narrative of being able to embrace enslavement as a way to civilize and elevate their experience? When you begin to reconcile this kind of false narrative versus these contemporary disparities tied to social justice issues, it begins to legitimize these narratives that are circulated within popular American culture about black racial deficiencies. And we see those being published, if you will, right? In works like The Bell Curve, 1994, by Richard Hernstein and Charles Murray. Controversial works like The End of Racism by Nish D'Souza and these conservative commentators published in 1995. They really help to, to justify these ideas that these disparities that we exist in the with today are a result of somehow African American inferiority, right? That's many ways what's, what's being anchored by that false narrative that in many ways the story of the 20 odd helped to counteract, helped to work against, and why they are significantly important uh, to sit at the foundation of the African American historical experience. So to talk about this revisionist power of the counter narrative that the 20 odd offered to African American history, why it serves as a rallying point. As we know, in 1619, uh, there were 32 Africans that were living uh, in Jamestown when the 20 odd arrived at Point Comfort. And we know that they were indentured servitudes. They were indentured servants. We've had ample discussion of how the historical record actually bears it out by looking at primary sources, right? And that distinction is significant. It's not to say that indentured servitude by any means was, was a glorious experience, right? It was awful for everyone involved, whether you were African or European. The vast majority of indentured servants, uh, once arriving into, into, into the colony early in its history, could expect to be dead within five to seven years. Right, so the point is not to glorify this idea of indentured servitude and the fact that the first Africans uh, arriving uh, in Jamestown in 1619 or in Point Comfort 1619 fall into that category, but it's an important point to highlight the fact that as indentured service, there was opportunity at the end of that servitude contract. Right? And I have this presentation an excellent job of bearing that out, right? showing how the ways in which some of these uh, Africans coming in to the colony in that moment in time were able to find opportunity at the inclusion of their four to seven year time period when their contracts came to an end, if you will. Uh, by 1649, just to give you a sense for the size of the black population, we had a roughly a population of, of 300 uh, people of African descent out of 18,500 by 1649 by mid-century. And as Catherine's presentation pointed out, that you are going to find Africans acquiring plantations and servants at the end of their contract. Now the idea of people finding prosperity at the end of their contract was a, was a somewhat unique experience when you look at the total scope of the service, whether you were European or African. So we're talking about a minority, but there was opportunity, and that opportunity was not shaped by race at this moment in time in Virginia's history. And again, we have the famous story of, of Anthony Mary Johnson, uh, very often spoken to you as a prime example of the opportunity that did exist within Jamestown, regardless of what your racial identity was. Anthony and Mary Johnson, at the end of their uh, servitude, were able to acquire a tobacco plantation of their own, a uh, 250 acre tobacco plantation, held their own servants by bringing head rights over. Uh, their sons were able to acquire land as well, a 100 acre and 550 acre tobacco plantation, and they said it represents another example of Africans being able to successfully use the legal system. 
In many ways, you look at people like Anthony Mary Johnson, they're able to exercise a full scope of civic rights available to any landowner within Jamestown. And that was the major distinction early in its history, whether you were a landowner or you were a, a person that did not own any land. And if you owned land, like the Johnsons, like other people that Catherine's kind of highlighted in her presentation, there was opportunity for success and development. That's going to begin to change. And that's where this notion of social justice really comes into play when you look at how the experience of the first advocates is changing in Virginia's history. In the 1640s, we see laws that are passed that prevent advocates from assembling in large groups, putting arms, and voting. I'll say that again. In the 1640s, Africans are barred from owning, from assembling in large groups, from owning arms, and voting. If you talk about voter suppression issues, right, this is the original voter suppression issue. What is a person, a landowner like Anthony Johnson to do, looking to inherit his land, or essentially allow his son and his grandson to inherit land when he's barred from the voting process? You're barred from the voting process within Jamestown, within the colony, you lose the power to shape decisions that, that, are shaped, that are going to shape your life. This is a social justice issue at play. This will be the springboard having the opportunity stripped away uh, from these Africans who were able to thrive within Jamestown in this early period of history. 1662, we find laws being passed in Virginia that continue to racialize the population. All children born in this country shall be held, bond, or free only according to the condition of the mother. So at this moment in time, the experience of being a bonded laborer becomes inheritable. African women are going to pass that on to their children, right? That's not something that's happening to European indentured servants. A European woman who gives birth to a, to a child, that child is not automatically falling into a bonded labor context, but for African women, you're going to find that begin to happen, right? They carry the condition of the mother. 1664, we'll find a law passed to European women marrying African men had to serve their masters, uh, their husband's master for the duration of their husband's life. So in many ways, we see laws being put in place that begin to discourage these interracial unions that the presentation has talked about uh, so far. 1667, another law passed that begins to block Christianity as a way to escape servitude. And Rick's presentation made this point really well. If you were a Christian within the context of a, a Christian state, it was out of balance to hold you in servitude, to hold you in, in, in slavery. So how do you find a way to hold people of African descent in perpetual servitude? You block conversion to Christianity. So you see that happening within the laws within Virginia. So between the 1640s and 1660s, you see an evolution in the racialization of Virginia's population and a marking out of a distinct and different experience. Right? Again, very early on, if you go back to 1619, whether you're European or African, if you were an indentured servant, you were having an awful experience, right? We're going to begin to see a like a splintering or a, or a gap begin to widen between uh, Europeans and Africans based upon the laws that are being put in place. Now, there are three specific moments that begin to take place later in Virginia's history that really begin to mark the full pivot and shift to using a racialized labor force based upon slavery to begin to power the plantations within Virginia. Uh, the first is Baker's Rebellion takes place in 1676, a critical moment. Um, Nathaniel Baker's a quick backstory. Uh, the son of a wealthy English merchant comes to Jamestown, wants to start a tobacco plantation, not enough land in the colony to go around. He gets upset uh, with the governor, Governor Berkeley at the time. He organizes disgruntled indentured servants, European indentured servants, African indentured servants whose experience is being racialized. And Native Americans, it launches a war against the colony, burning Jamestown to the ground. In the aftermath of the rebellion, if anyone make it dies, it gets sick. Of course, the rebellion gets the cold, passes away, the rebellion falls apart. But in the aftermath, one of the big learning experiences and opportunities for those in charge of Jamestown was that they better not treat European servants in such a harsh way. So we're going to see the effort to begin to soften that experience for European indentured servants. But what does that mean for the productive productivity of tobacco plantations? As we begin to mark this effort to pivot to using enslaved African labor. Another thing that's happening over the course of this period is that we're seeing a change in the economic cost structure between indentured servitude and slavery. Even though we didn't have slavery in name and in law within Virginia at this moment in history, it is and exists in some of the parts of the, the new world, if you will. By the time we get to 1700, it's actually become less expensive to import an enslaved person relative to indentured servitude within the colony. That's largely because life expectancies have gone up as we get later into the century. 
Early on, again, 1619, you show up in the colony as a Dutch servant, whether or not you're European or African, you can expect to be dead in about three years. By the time you get to the 1700, the average life expectancy, because infrastructure has been more developed in the colony, is about 20 years. It's also coinciding with the, the, the England getting involved in the slave trading business, with the charting of the Royal African Company in 1660, so they're actively engaged in slave trading as well. And there are just more people involved, there's more infrastructure on the West African coast that's there to support the, the slave trade, so the cost, if you will, you know, per individual is, is actually going down over the course of this period. The last thing that really begins to seal the deal are the Virginia slave codes in 1705. They do two key things, if you will, when it comes to marking that pivot. First, in the Virginia Slave Code of 1705, it actually legally softens the experience of bonded labor for white servants. You can no longer beat servants, you can, in, uh, you can no longer punish or whip servant, white servants without a court order from a judge, and you're legally obligated to provide them adequate um, food, shelter, and clothing. And the same codes mandate that all people of African descent will be blocked from Christianity, and that all people of African descent uh, by virtue of being blocked from Christianity, will automatically convert to being enslaved. Mm. So what does that mean for the broader scope of African American history, and why we find the, the 20 and odd at its foundation? The truth of their experience, right, the reality that they, they had an experience of shape or opportunity, tells us that racial equality of early Virginia really challenges the notion of racial inferiority, right? You wouldn't have found an example like Anthony Johnson without the existence of opportunity all that exists within early Virginia society, and that the rights that were taken away from Africans were intentionally stripped away, right? These laws were the consequence of decision makers looking to reallocate wealth and power within Virginia's early society. People chose to pass these laws, right? People chose to block people like Anthony Johnson from being able to exercise their right to vote. So it reminds us that this, this idea of social justice was, was a problem at really Jamestown, and that idea of social justice becomes that connecting thread that goes from our very early colonial history through the Civil War into Reconstruction and through the Civil Rights Movement even to issues that are tied today. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, all the work, um, and I'm going to try to be quick and uh, thorough. So, the title of my presentation is Writing the Record of the Crisis of African American Curricular Injustice and Necessary Correctives. Um, I've been, uh, I've been right in the Africana Studies Program at Morehouse College, and I've been working around curriculum um, uh, actually for quite a long time now. I don't know how well I've done in terms of doing that work. But since about 1993, I've been working with different groups to develop curriculum. And what I want to share, I think it's, a, it's based upon some of those insights um, uh, in terms of begin, being a student of African American history. I, I see my challenge today as to do basically what one of my most important mentors, um, Mr. Willie Dean Harford, I say Dr. Willie Dean Harford, um, who passed away this, this year, um, but he was a historian, a professor, and a mentor. He was the director for the African American Studies program at the University of South Carolina when I was there in undergrad. Um, and I, he really mentored me and a whole group, several generations of, of students to engage in that work. Um, so I wanted to dedicate this work to him because I think he best exemplifies what we have to get our students to do, and that is to become historians themselves. Even if they don't get paid for it, make them become historians in your churches, in your homes, in the classrooms. And that's Dean. Mm -hmm. uh, so this presentation addresses several uh, persistent problems in writing and teaching African American history, arguing that the current Whitewood Lurch, um, referred to very well by uh, Dr. Murphy, by Rick, um, in terms of the fake news and all of that, that we really have an opportunity to address the, that political direction. Um, and to challenge our students to, to engage in that work as well. Um, but that rightward lurch has its foundations in a flawed educational curriculum. 
Um, uh, we're, we see several problems in Southern education that have to be addressed. And I outline this presentation the, with the following five challenges. The first, the problem of fear and balanced curriculum, and I'm signifying on Fox News there. Rick, I thought you might appreciate that um, with your significations on a certain president that we have right now. Second, um, looking at this question of miseducation and the genealogy of white supremacy, um, we'll talk about what do we mean by that. Third, restoring agency and humanity of the enslaved. In some ways, that's really what this presentation, what this whole conference has been about. Uh, fourth, res restoring the record of resistance against slavery. And then fifth, the required synthesis of methods in terms of research and teaching methods. Um, uh, Rick mentioned earlier the, some of the games that are played in terms of the curriculum. Um, and, you know, this came out just, uh, at, well, in, in March, but there are a couple of um, articles that came out just this, this month talking about how teachers teach slavery. And um, one of those horrible examples being um, just what, what Rick described, that uh, black students are lined up on one side of the classroom, white students on another, and then the white students were directed to chase the black students to recreate slavery. Um, you have to you have to kind of think about what, what are you really trying to reinforce? Are you really trying to educate there? Or to reinforce a power dynamic um, that, that you want to see continue into, it, into perpetuity. So I would recommend um, uh, humbly that we do a couple of things differently. Um, I, I don't think that we can start wrong if we begin with Du Bois. Uh, du Bois makes this argument in his, in his collection of essays called Dark Water. And it's from a book called The Souls of White Folk that I would highly, well, excuse me, the essay is called The Souls of White Folk in the book Dark Water. I would highly recommend that you read it. Um, but he says that the indictment of Africa against Europe is great. Uh, for 400 years, white Europe has, was the chief support of that training of human beings, which first and last robbed black Africa of 100 million human, human beings. Of course, oh, maybe overstating a little bit, but still understand what he's saying transformed the face of her social life, overthrew organized government, distorted ancient industry, and snuffed out the lights of cultural development. We have to recognize what is going on when you see these games being played like this. This is not arbitrary. In some ways, um, I would also give another example. In uh, South Carolina, in Columbia, South Carolina, I have a cousin, a very close cousin of mine, who has three boys, two of those young boys, um, uh, my cousin Carrie, she complained about the fact that um, her youngest son, Joshua, was made to um, do an essay and to do a project on the positives of Benjamin R. Tillman. Now, if y'all don't know Benjamin Pitchfork Tillman, I can tell you just a little bit about him, but in, instead of actually going into depth of what he did, anybody ever heard of him? Yes? You've heard of Benjamin Pitchfork Tillman? Absolutely. Here's what Benjamin R. Tillman said in 1908. He says, when I look around and I see how many Negroes also are not guilty of race suicide, I must confess the cold-blooded fact that the Negroes are ahead of us. And in, unless disease, syphilis, tuberculosis, alcoholism, or something else shall come along and desolate these people, unless we do get reinforcements, the struggle for mastery as between a majority of Negroes and a minority of whites is bound to come. He delivered, I thought, I found this essay in 1912, I didn't find it in 1908, I found it in 1989 um, at our uh, library, but he delivered several of these speeches about population dynamics, and what it was, was this question about political majority that you saw developing um, in South Carolina, in Louisiana, in Mississippi. In the case of South Carolina, they were able to translate that majority into a major state house majority. Tillman saw himself as one of those redemptive forces trying to restore white supremacy. After Wade Hampton, Governor Wade Hampton, who was a Civil War, Civil War uh, commander, um, not a general, but a commander, I'm sorry, you no, know, his rank, um, but he's trying to restore white supremacy. So in doing that, he's talking about this importance of a population and getting white reinforcements. Tillman took pride in using a pitchfork in at least one racial program against black folks at Edgewood, South Carolina. So when my cousin uh, 
Carrie, she, she raised the question. She was like, you know, what am I going to do? This, you know, she was very upset. My son has to find the positives of Benjamin Tillman. Um, and I want you to imagine, if this was in Germany, if you had today in 2019 a Jewish student, and I, we do know that they passed a law talking about the Kippa and not wanting to, to, to have Jewish people threatened because of you know, the possibility of wearing the Kippa and being targeted, but if a Jewish student today in, in Germany was tasked with finding the positives of an Adolf Hitler, and this man, he is no different from a Himmler, from a Hitler or a general, however you want to, however you want to put it, it's very problematic. So we have to recognize that uh, President 45, we're on 45, he's, he's, he's seconding, he's, he's pushing this agenda of, um, of, of getting more conservative whites to stand up for this post-Confederate history that we see talk, uh, discussed and uh, debated in America right now. We can't shy away from, them, from our students. If we want to attract our students to this material, you have to take them to the hot spots and get them to debate and discuss these issues and to write editorials, to do research, to find out who are these people that are, um, that are being introduced in, in these curricula as potential heroes. I would argue another thing that we should, should be doing is to actually place that worldview that I would consider conservatism or white supremacy, I would, uh, we would want to put that in a global context and understand the fullest history of how, how it actually developed. And if we're doing that, then we have to look beyond before the 1619 date, and we have to actually look at the Spaniards. The Spanish, we know, are the first to develop a racial caste system or racial caste system, um, where, of course, whites from Spain are at the top, whites born in the uh, Americas are second, and then at the bottom you have clustered Africans and Native Americans, pure Africans at the very, very bottom, then just above that, Zambos, Mulatos, Pardos, um, and, and on and on. So Spain uh, was trying to develop a system that actually would guard against, one of the slides I took out was this very famous painting called The King's Fountain. It's from uh, Portugal, and I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but if you just Google it, you look up The King's Fountain, you'll see this is a cityscape in Lisbon, Portugal, and you have scores of African people alongside whites, alongside Jews. You have apparently some Moriscos or Muslims, Muslim descendants. And I would argue that Spain was trying to prevent the development of a multiracial society because when we look at Spain's history, we see a couple of very interesting things. The Reconquista, the Spanish resettlement, re reconquest of uh, Spain from Muslim forces. Um, coincides with, of course, the so-called discovery of the Americas. 1492 is the Reconquista, 1492 is Columbus's discovery of the, of the Caribbean and what we would come to know as the Americas. But what we should also understand is that Spain's uh, attempt to push the Muslims out would, had a lot to do with the, with the presence of Jewish people in their population and the development of what they would call limpieza de sangre, that is the purity, the cleanliness of blood. Because they wanted to argue that, that uh, they argued that the Jews, you could pass on the hatred of Christ through the blood. And that if you could point to a pure population that had no Jewish ancestry, then that actually, you could talk about some, or some early racial hygiene laws coming from this. That's what I'm basically saying here. Um, but I think we have to look at that history. The first date that you have enslaved Africans taken to the Americas is 1502. That is the same year where you have the, the mass expulsion of Muslims um, uh, from Spain. And that's another one. Took out too many of my really good images. Um, but there's some not very, very interesting images of this. So, uh, the Spaniards cast out over 400,000 uh, uh, Muslim descendants, Moriscos, between, 50, between 1492 and uh, the early 1600s. So while you're talking about the colonization of the Americas, there's also this cultural purity dynamic um, and campaign going on that, that takes, begins to take on a racial dynamic as well. 
1526, you have the Morisco Rebellion. The Moriscos rebel and they are pushed out again, marginalized. The same first, that 1526 date should sound familiar. Last year I presented on uh, uh, the, the argument that 1619 is not the first date in African history, um, but it is actually 93 years after the first date in African American history, which would be in 1526. Um, that, in that year, you had 100 enslaved Africans taken um, to uh, what is South Carolina, Georgia. 1568, the Morisco Bank. 1609, 1614, excuse me, the Morisco Expulsion takes place. Have our students have a bird's eye view of what's going on here so that they don't see their history as some isolated case of black folks in America being marginalized. Um, okay. Uh, I think we should also, of course, develop that global perspective, explain what is happening where Africans become vulnerable to enslavement, tied into the fracturing of their political states. This one, in, in this case, on the left, you see Songhai. On the right, Songhai post the Battle of Tokdibi. Um, and I think that is important also. If we understand what is happening, why do you, how can you actually have 12 million Africans captured in the slave trade, 10 million of them surviving um, through a process that we know involved at least those seven steps. And I think we would have to actually take a look at um, developing a bird's eye view perspective and actually having our students think about critical turning points in history. We know, we have enough information now, we know at least these six turning points actually caused the cascade of events that led to the transatlantic slave trade, the trans-Saharan slave trade, and the Indian Ocean slave trade. The first slave trade treaty in 643, the Moorish invasion of Spain, 711, um, spurring the, expo the age of exploration in Prince Henry, the navigator's school, his navigational school. Uh, third, the uh, Elmina slave factory being built, 1482. 1526, the first Africans being enslaved. At the same time that you have uh, the last of those great West African empires, we have to raise questions, get students to think about the controversies. How can you have these powerful African states alongside the rise of a system that would devastate Africa in terms of the transatlantic slave trade? And we want to do this, of course, by focusing our students on, wait a minute, I'm sorry, um, on an active role. So what I have my students do is to create, and this is in the college classroom, to recreate what that enslavement process was like. They can read, they have to read, but then they have to write the story and actually tell the story of those six stages of enslavement. Okay, I'm sorry, I lost my place, my uh, apologies. Um, there we go. Um, so they have to actually write the story of an enslaved African. They are using the Trans Transatlantic Slave Voyages um, website, and that is a critical resource that I will definitely uh, call you, ask you to use, slavevoyages.org, that, that particular website. So by getting our students to be active participants in this history, I think we can actually attract more students to the study. But we have to get, student, we have to get teachers who are interested in a new pedagogy. Um, to, to get involved and to, to really to participate in OGS and other professional organizations. I think it's also going to take a greater degree of collaboration between OGS and uh, other organizations like ASALA, like NCBS, like OSWAD, and the, those organizations, I think through that we could address some of those, uh, those challenges in a, in, a, in a clearer way. Thank you very much. And the last thing, <laughs> students can actually create images like this when they actually um, develop timelines. I, I love timelines. They help students explain historical change. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs>
because I, I, I wanted to show students what they could do to explain this period. This period is called Terrible Transformation. It lasts from 1526 until 1705, and we've talked about in Virginia in particular, where those slave code laws um, are passed and the intensification of racial slavery develops. I've been teaching about John Brower, um, who in 1641 brought a court case so that he could actually have his, um, his, his uh, child um, baptized. And I didn't know that that was one of your ancestors. One of your ancestors. So it's just interesting how we, how we come full circle like that. He actually um, indentured his son once he um, got him from um, Lieutenant Shepard, who actually owned him. Once he did that, he took him and immediately indentured him, but that gave that child an inmate on his contract and allowed for his freedom. So you find these African indenturing their children over and over to make sure that was their, that was their road to freedom. So that was important to do. Any other questions? Jean, you want to close out? You want me to wait? Um, uh, on behalf of the Afro-American Historical Geological Society, I want to thank all of you for coming today, particularly on this beautiful June day, <laughs> indoors, when you could have been outside doing so much more. We know there are a lot of activities going on in the Hampton area this week, but you chose to come. We appreciate your, your, your accepting new ideas from our panel members whether it was a discussion on the Middle Passage, whether it was discussion on the, uh, the English and how they indentured and why they indentured, whether it was a discussion about Hampton and where it was and where it is today, whether it was a discussion about who the original Africans were by knowing them by name, or understanding the evolution of, of the community and, and the whole aspect of our African history, and how to introduce us and teach us to our children. So we want to thank you. If you have any ideas, any suggestions on how we can improve this, um, we hope to take this educational forum elsewhere in the state and elsewhere. We appreciate you being warm guests and hosts to us, um, and we look forward to doing this again. Thank you very much, and on behalf of Oggs, thank you. <laughs>